are live. So, well, it's, uh, housing Colorado. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Legislative yeah. agenda for the state. Perfect. Yeah. I would like to call to order the City of Boulder Housing Advisory Board regular meeting for January 22nd, 2020. Welcome everyone to the new year. Um, Terry, can we start with you on roll call? Like Terry Pomos present. Juliette Boone. Judy Nod. Jacques Trivien. Dan Teodoro, present. Mason Moyer. Dave Einstein, I'm voting ex officio. Okay. Um, first, I'll ask if anybody else has anything for the agenda besides what I have, so nice. but it doesn't look like it. Um, so if you noted, I sent out a, an email this morning. We have had the good fortune of having the opportunity for an update on the state legislative agenda, what's going on for them. And so we are adding it in at the last minute here. So I would like to put forth a motion that we... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put forth the motion that we add a state legislative update to the agenda just after the report on key indicators and the home wanted campaign. Second. Okay, we're seconded by Mason. <laughs> um, any discussion? We can vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Okay, do we have public participation? Did you just vote on the minutes? I'm sorry, the minutes. No, I was too fast. I skipped the minutes. <laughs> Let me open that up real quick. So we have the approval of the minutes from November 20. Yeah, from November 20th. And um, you wanna do a motion or shall I again? To approve the minutes. All right, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from November 20th. Second. Okay, so the motion's approved and a vote to approve the minutes. All in favor? Aye. 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 So we have approved the minutes, unanimous vote from November 20th, 2019. All right, and now on to public comment, we have. I'll give you a moment to get your jacket off, Lynn. We're rolling fast. Lynn Sigel, 538 Dewey. I'm just interested in commentary about the um, meeting last night about code and tiny homes. I mean, at the risk of stating the obvious, um, yes, what everyone needs uh, to not be homeless is to have a house, duh, you know, but see, we have this problem in Boulder. We're building as fast as we can, as high as we can. In fact, in discussion today with Harburg, the former utility director, Edward Stafford, and a number of folks, um, I, I mean, Harburg was saying, yeah, if you could build tiny homes and stack them up, then you'd have a draw on the um, capacity of the utility system for water, sewer, and that as such. But we don't, but the value is sunk in the land. And as I heard at one of these last meetings, someone was complaining their rent's going up three times for their lot on their mobile home, our cheapest housing in Boulder. And now we're taking that away up at Ponderosa. So what are we gonna do here? You gotta go to the source, you gotta go to the core, or else all you're gonna do is be fighting your way in circles, chasing your tail. Um, we've gotta balance jobs housing, and you are not in an, an illustrious position, and I, I don't envy your position as the Housing Advisory Board because you can't do, sh you know, S, right? Okay, you can't because there's not an integrated system operating here. We need sub-area plans. We need this housing crisis dealt with on a major scale, planning board, and and then you can do your job. Otherwise, you know what I'd do? I'd fucking, excuse me, F-ing strike. I'd strike because you can't do your job. 
there's no way you can. Um, now these mobile tiny homes, yeah, you can put them in, you can change, you can rezone, that's what I was told. You have to rezone because they don't go into the present code. Um, so what are you gonna rezone? And, and sprinkler systems, if they're relevant for me, they're sure gonna be relevant for tiny homes that are in the same parameter and have the same fire danger, and we've got a five minute occurrence now, you know, we've got a 20 minute response now, and a five minute is what, we're ne what we need to do, so that's what went through on the codes, is we need, you know, we need to balance that in some way that we can protect for fire. So, these are issues, just a few, but you know, go on strike. <laughs> <laughs> that's my recommendation. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks for that, Lynn. Um, okay, so as we've added this next little level, we'll try to be as effective as we can. And um, matters from the board, um, Chris, actually, Judy, yeah. turn it to you. So I asked if I could introduce this section. Um, this is the trends report. Um, it's put out every two years by the Community Foundation serving Boulder County. When I was working in nonprofits, I couldn't wait for it to come out because that's how we validated the data that we use to um, apply for funding. Um, and now that I am retired, I can enjoy much more of the report than I really paid attention to before. I love it, it has gorgeous pictures, great stories, and deals has separate chapters on all sorts of issues like the environment, um, the arts, um, all sorts of issues. Um, we have asked Chris to come tonight to talk just about housing issues in Boulder County, and Chris is the Vice President of Strategic Initiatives um, at the Community Foundation and, and really spearheaded putting this together, I think. So I'm very happy to have him here, and this is Chris Bard. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Judy. Um, I understand we have 30 minutes, and that uh, first half of that 15 minutes, I'll be um, pointing out the highlights from our housing indicators, and then we can spend 15 minutes uh, just kind of Q&A, informal conversation. This will be a great lead in to Danica talking about the Home Wanted campaign uh, and also certainly hearing from um, the state level voice. Um, so let's dive right in. What you've got in front of you is the, as Judy said, the Trends Magazine. It comes out every two years. Uh, we're also going year round now. There's a podcast in partnership with KGNU. Uh, we have Boulder County's first bilingual reporter now at KGNU doing a Trends podcast. Comes out every few weeks and first, um, Several podcasts have been um, uh, really emphasizing housing issues, so worth taking a look if you just go over to KGNU's website or ours. Um, let's dive right in. So um, the Community Foundation is able to do the Trends Report. We've been now, this is our 11th edition. Uh, this is how we act like a nonprofit, and uh, we do this uh, with the support of the community. And um, we uh, hope you Follow us on our blog and on social media and uh, join our sponsors in financially supporting this important work, those of you out there in Channel 8 land. Um, so let's dive into our economy and housing and start off with the chart that I call the most consequential indicator in our whole magazine. Uh, this is what's been going on with uh, home prices over the last 15 years. As you know, they've doubled everywhere in Boulder County. The navy blue line on top is the price of an average Boulder home, which we know is uh, medium price is hovering right around a million dollars by now. Uh, and all the other cities have followed the same pattern. They started at a lower price point, they ended at a lower price point, but they're also doubling. And so um, really this last seven or eight years has been the hockey stick that has um, uh, really drawn our attention. And now more than 60% of residents don't earn enough to buy a house here. Um, the city and the county's uh, housing crisis creates a system of haves and have-nots and uh, in which the have is housing more than income. Those with stable, affordable housing um, get to enjoy all the advantages of staying in a place entails and those without struggle. Uh, according to the Longmont Housing Affordability Review of Boulder County wide real estate in 2017, there are, quote, no entry-level housing options left. Um, 
in fact, they, um, they, they say costs have risen so high that there's a complete end to affordable housing. So when we talk about what percent of the housing stock is affordable, it just depends on what your cut point is. Uh, the cut point used to be $150,000 until just a couple of years ago for a condo uh, or $250,000 for a single family dwelling unit. You can see on this chart they had to um, look at uh, jumping from 250 to 360 to find three transactions in Boulder that qualified as affordable, and all of those were in the affordable program out of a total unit sold of 628. Um, so it is in the eyes of the beholder whether we have just a little bit of affordable housing or zero affordable housing. Um, we caught up with Nikki and Noah Larson for this year's uh, Trends Report. Uh, Trends Magazine, the way we like to do it is we look at 150 ways to look at the social, economic, and environmental health of the community. Then we talk with experts about, as David Letterman used to say, is this a thing? When we confirm that it is, then we look for our neighbors who are in the middle of whatever this trend points to, and then we um, tell the story from their point of view. So this is Nikki and Noah Larson. They spent 10 years in Boulder. They were renting. They felt like model citizens. They helped out after the Four Mile Fire. They stumped for various candidates and issues. And when it came time to uh, buy a house, uh, they realized that uh, their price point was in Wheat Ridge, and that's where they're pictured on the front stoop of their Wheat Ridge home, which they own proudly now. Um, and so they, um, according to Nikki, how a community approaches housing is really the question of who it wants to live there. Uh, the majority of Boulder residents rent. That's 55% of Boulder residents. Uh, and they spend too much of their paychecks doing so. You can see on this chart that uh, in Boulder, the um, uh, owner-occupied housing, um, those who are spending more than 30% on their mortgage uh, is one out of four uh, people in Boulder, and renters spending more than 30% of their income is 61% of the renters in Boulder. That's the generally accepted benchmark, as you know. If you're spending more than 30% of your monthly uh, take home on rent, then you're out of whack. And you can see that we are uh, higher than the U.S. averages in both those metrics. So Boulder is the sixth most expensive metro for home prices in the United States, according to the National Association of Realtors. Um, people are constantly finding creative ways to live here. And so there's a story in our magazine of uh, roommates Holly Ann Giffen and Fiona uh, Pigeot, uh, they met on Craigslist looking for a place to rent, and they rented a place together. They got along great. They're platonic friends, and they decided to co-invest. One of them works at Twitter, and that made it possible for them to create a, uh, a strategy where uh, the, the roommate with the higher income would uh, have more equity in the home because she was putting down more. And they made that work, and they're making the point um, that, you know, they acknowledge they couldn't have done it if Fiona didn't work at Twitter. And in Boulder, uh, the reality is that you need two incomes, and you need at least one that's higher than average, and that's been their experience. So th that's where we're at, and this is where home prices really are uh, making it so that even current demographics no longer match current home prices. Uh, this is an interesting statistic. Over the last 10 years or so, there have been three and a half jobs created in Boulder County for every uh, housing, new housing unit. Uh, so if you believe that you need um, more than one housing unit for th every three and a half new jobs, then that would be an out of whack pace that we're on. Uh, when you think about the Diagonal Highway, Arapaho, um, other arteries uh, into Boulder, and you think about the fact that four out of five Boulder County residents uh, work in Boulder County. Where are the jobs? It's here in Boulder where there's two jobs for every adult. Um, that, and then you think about whether we've added any lanes to any of those arteries. It helps to start to explain um, the difference in traffic that those of us who've been here more than 10 years have uh, been experiencing. Um, Child care costs rival housing. Uh, it's really like paying uh, college tuition almost um, for young families that are trying uh, 
uh, to make a go of Boulder. That's why you, uh, on average, um, see uh, you know, you're seeing less and less families with young children here in Boulder. They're living east of here. Uh, annual cost of child care here is almost twice what it would be just down the road in Pueblo. <laughs> so when we talk about you know financial struggles of of our of our neighbors, it's important to understand that the federal poverty level is sort of um, n not relevant to the cost of living. Uh, the the uh, self-sufficiency standard has been measured to be about three and a half times the federal poverty level. Um, so it's not really until you're making 350 percent of the federal poverty level that you are um, really able to afford the bare minimum, which includes housing, transportation, food, health care, taxes, child care of applicable and miscellaneous costs. Another thing worth noting and a reason, uh, one of many reasons for the recent equity push everywhere is that in Boulder County, Anglo, that's non-Hispanic white households, uh, on average are earning uh, the self-sufficiency standard. You see that match between what Anglo uh, households in Boulder County of 85,000 roughly matches to roughly 85,000 that you need for the self-sufficiency standard. However, Latino households earn less here than elsewhere. Um, and they are earning here about half the self-sufficiency standard and that's less than Latino households are earning on average significantly uh, than across the U.S. So put another way, Latino households are earning 58 cents on the Anglo household dollar uh, here in Boulder County compared to 76 cents on the dollar on average across the United States. Boulder County is home to the largest gender-based wage gap of any its of its closest neighbors and lags Colorado and the U.S. in gender pay equity. This is something that we're partnering with the YWCA this year to dig deeper into to try to parse out and figure out what some of those drivers are. Um, women working full-time here in Boulder County earn on average 74 cents for every dollar a full-time working man does in Boulder County. This chart is tracking wages according to education levels. So you see it progressing from high school dropout on up to graduate or professional degree. So the question would be here in the city of Boulder in particular, where we have more per capita women with advanced degrees than anywhere in the United States, um, why is the, compensa the compensation for women uh, so much less than for men. A uh, couple drivers I'd point to, lots of kind of um, traditionally um, male dominated, dominated uh, sectors of our local economy include, you know, tech, STEM type jobs. Um, and also I, I think that with the wealth that is in this town, uh, we actually have more old fashioned conservative family structures um, than we may assume that we have. Uh, here on average in Boulder with uh, a wage earner uh, out in the workforce and um, with their spouse at home. But like I said, um, best guesses aren't sufficient. We're going to spend some effort with the YWCA looking more deeply into this. Um, you may have seen uh, AFA's recent thought paper uh, about how ending child poverty in the city of Boulder could be done, in fact, for about 3.5% of the city of Boulder's budget. Um, they note that uh, that $5.4 million that if we distributed it out to the 600 families uh, below the federal poverty level here in Boulder, um, that, that would represent uh, less than what we spend on municipalization uh, e each year on average here in Boulder. And you can see on this chart that uh, families uh, who are, have children and are living under the poverty level, that's 8% of our neighbors. Uh, however, you again need to look up to who's below 350% of the federal poverty level and you start catching lots and lots and lots more than just 8% of our community. Um, there's an article in here uh, featuring what's been going on with the housing first approach in Boulder. It's a really promising story. This is a photo of the 31 fully finished 
one bedroom apartments at 1175 Lee Hill Road, uh, who house, uh, which houses chronically homeless residents with a housing first approach. Uh, it costs about $43,000 a year to let someone remain unhoused, according to Jennifer Bless, Homeless Services Systems Manager for Boulder County. She says they're often using emergency medical response, interacting with police and the justice system in addition to sheltering services. Permanently supportive housing, meanwhile, which includes the cost of subsidizing rent plus connections to services, costs 20,000 per year per person. Uh, Boulder County's new coordinated entry approach is focused on getting those without housing into housing. Danica's gonna get much more into this. Just wanted to point out a couple of efforts on the affordable housing front that you're well aware of. Um, but for viewers at home, the Home Wanted campaign, stay tuned for more information on that. Um, and also Boulder Together out of the Boulder Chamber. Both are tackling workforce housing. Uh, this is a photo here of Malik Johnston and his roommate over at the Ingram, I believe Ingram Co-op here in Boulder. Um, as you know, you know that's, that's one way to, um, for, for people to find a way to live here in Boulder. He's been working at a local nonprofit originally from Iowa, I believe, and you know, he says, hey, it's been a nice couple years um, here in my 20s, uh, but I don't see a future for myself being able to invest here, build wealth, um, and it's the way he puts it, um, it's, it's hard to do good for a living and make a living wage here. Um, so the Boulder Chamber, as I mentioned, launched Boulder Together to tackle the root causes of the biggest challenges for companies in the city, hiring. Boulder County's, uh, Boulder's high housing costs force workers into long commutes. 50,000 people travel into the city each day, again in that traffic we talked about, and Boulder Together has set an ambitious goal of doubling the number of rental units and homes for sale for low and middle income workers and Boulder County's leading home wanted campaign, Danica will speak to that, calls on communities, businesses, and agencies throughout Boulder County to address our region's escalating housing needs. Uh, at the end of every chapter, and certainly included in the housing and economy chapter, there's just a box about what can you do. I just wanted to point a few of the highlights about what we as individuals can do. Uh, for one thing, support government policies that create and preserve housing for all socioeconomic demographics from working families to seniors. For another thing, if you own a business, uh, pay your employees a living wage. Check in regularly to make sure you're not paying women less. If you are, make adjustments. There's a story in here about um, a, a company that uh, did just that. They, they weren't uh, aware of the uh, inequity and then when they sought to fix it, they did. Uh, be flexible with your hours if you can to accommodate working parents. Consider providing or compensating for childcare. Uh, which is prohibitively expensive for most families, as we pointed out earlier. If you own property or have an extra room in your home, consider renting it out at an affordable rate. Uh, to aging seniors, people with disabilities, formerly unhoused residents, families with children or lower wage workers. And finally, consider investing in Goose Creek Community Land Trust, an organization attempting to leverage resident money to provide housing for people across the socioeconomic spectrum. Um, finally, no trends presentation between now and April 1st would be complete without a plug for the census. Uh, that's one thing that we're partnering with um, interested parties across the county on right now, making sure that uh, we are getting as complete and accurate account as possible. Uh, this equates to about $2,300 per nose counted in the 55 different federal funding streams that land right here in our town. Uh, multiply that by 10 years until the next census and you're talking about missing out on $23,000 worth of federal funding for every person that goes uncounted. Um, so this is something that we're really promoting um, and um, when the census goes live on um, March 12th and extending for really two months until May 12th and even beyond that, um, we encourage people to spend 10 minutes over at census.org filling out the answers to nine questions that will um, affect uh, representation in democracy, um, as well as federal funds uh, for the next 10 years of all of our lives. So um, 
that's it. We can all take steps to answer the pressing needs outlined uh, in this particular chapter and in the report. We invite you to join the conversation by reading this report, uh, following along with the New Trends podcast on KGNU that I mentioned, and engage with your neighbors to build a more connected and inclusive community. So with that, um, I'll open it up for questions. Yeah, thanks. So um, just anybody questions, we'll start out. I'll start then. I have one for you, which is, uh, you mentioned the Latino kind of numbers versus Anglo as far as income. Wage gap, yeah. The wage gap. Do you have a, do we have numbers on the number of employees in Boulder that are Latino employees or Latinx employees hmm. versus Anglo or other, so that breakdown of jobs by demographic, just curious if you know that. Yeah, you know, about, speaking of the census, about two thirds of our information is derived from the census and the community, American Community Survey. I believe I know where to find that information and I could get back to you on it. It's not in my brain right now. Okay, yeah, that'd be great just to make a... So you're curious about the total number of Latinos in the workforce here in Boulder? Yeah, the total number... I think we can find that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, just that breakdown in general would be great to, okay. to understand a little bit better. I'd be also, happy to Because then we can really see how that, you know, discontinuity in, in income and in wages is really affecting and impacting. Yeah, it really compounds on itself. Um, when you start you know, looking at how um, our middle class is getting more and more hollowed out um, here in Boulder, um, Elizabeth Garner, our state demographer, makes the point that for every six-figure job that is brought to a town, that creates another $25,000 job because people who are wealthy enough not to need to do their own laundry, clean their own house, make their own coffee, bring their own lunch to work, are relying on that part of the economy that employs people at about $25,000 a year to provide those services to them. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Anybody else? Judy. No, I was just wondering, are you oh. going to ask the people out there if they have any questions? Um, yeah, I think I can let us roll through here okay. if anybody has, and then we can. Juliet? I, I was curious about the university component when you talk about the rental population here. I have two children in college. Children, they're not quite children anymore, but they were in, living in our home, and now they are renters because mm -hmm. they're at CU, um, and they're in the same city. So. I'm curious about what percentage of that population is student driven versus other. And I'm curious also about how that compares with similar towns of our size, college towns that have, are, are there similar issues or percentages um, as it relates to the rental population? Mm -hmm. I think what you're keying in on is um, the stat that says the majority here rent about 55%. And so, of course, in a town of, we're somewhere around 115,000 right now in population, um, then quick in the head math, that, that, that means like, you know, about 60,000 people are renting. And when you think about the um, undergraduate student population who are not uh, on campus and not commuting from outside of Boulder or living at home, yes, certainly there's a slug of them uh, you know, in that, that represents the fact that we're in a college town, but it would not be the majority. Um, it may be harder than you think to break that down. Um, we would need to rely on uh, CU's numbers, and of course, they may have statistics that get at it, but are not dispositive. They would be able to track, um, you know, the simple math of how many undergraduates do they have and then what do they see as far as who's in their housing. Um, I don't know that they have a, uh, a survey giving the best guess on how many thousands of students are renting in the city of Boulder. Yes, I th you might be uh, getting ready to answer it because you guys just had a meeting up there not too long ago. I don't know if you were a part of it or not. So. <coughs> 
with a, well, I was just gonna comment that we do have a team that is has looked at that issue and we actually have some data. I'm not prepared tonight to share the numbers with you, but I can definitely send it out, um, share it with your group, it. yeah, because we've kind of dissected of these types of numbers, how many are represented through the student population. So we can follow up with that. I'm not sure what you were referencing. Yeah, so kind of like Google, um, I know a couple of people uh, on campus who work in administrative positions and for students to get certain things, they have to say where they're living at and they are tracking all of that, but the housing, they're very tight-lipped about it and I know Kurt had met with them so I was curious if we had cracked into any of that data, if there was gonna be some type of mutual sharing in that, in, Mm -hmm. in those numbers, so I'll be curious to see what you got. But they they track like Google. They know exactly where everybody's at and how far they're driving and, because they base all their parking and everything else on on it. Great. And I, I would love to get new indicators, particularly ones that are so relevant, particularly in the city of Boulder, that question about um, how is the undergraduate student population making us unique? Uh, is a question that I get from different angles all the time. And so any hard data that is at the population level for the city of Boulder, or even better yet county, but I'll take the city, would be something I'd love to consider for future reports. Yeah. So uh, I thought the uh, statistics on the housing for the homeless and, and you know the relative cost was uh, fascinating. So the two questions I have on that is, first of all, for those numbers, from uh, statewide or national average, or is that specific to that Boulder project that we were looking at? So, and I, from memory, I think what we were talking about um, just in round numbers was uh, the citation from the county level expert saying that they've, they've estimated that it costs about $43,000 for someone to be unhoused in Boulder County, and then they estimate $20,000 for this housing that they're providing. Now you're asking, is her source statewide or is it a local study? And I, I don't know. I was the editor on that chapter, not the reporter, mm -hmm. um, okay. but I could get back to you on that. And I was just interested because I mean, that's you know pretty profound to have some of those numbers and tackle an issue that nobody ever wants to tackle. My, my other it, question. And I would just also add that if it, if it is not a Boulder County specific where we know Boulder County's cost of living is higher, that $43,000 would only be higher if you got more hyper local about it. Absolutely, right. Yeah. And so then the other question is, do those statistics in any way talk about, so if we have 43,000 say for emergency services for the unhoused, um, what kind of reduction do we see in that when we go to housing the homeless? I mean, because I think that's part of the compelling argument, you know, to address that, you know, it costs this much and you save this much as well. Right. You know, um, that, that is the whole concept upon which the recent wave of social impact bonds, you know, I mean, they do this with um, looking at uh, prisons. They do it looking at education. You can do it looking at housing. Uh, it would be a very innovative um, strategy to explore and we don't have time to get into how that whole pricing structure works, but as you may know, basically you have some government provider of services who has just got a leak in the bottom of their budget that an intervention um, can close, and you have to have an inked agreement between the provider of those services and the provider of the intervention that if it bears out, that savings is realized by the service provider, that service provider will pay the intervention some portion of their savings, and then you get a virtuous cycle going. Right. Um, <coughs> Jacques, I'd like to add, uh, along the lines of what you're saying, but also from information from the retreat and council yesterday is, uh, um, we keep talking about the unhoused as if it's also a stagnant number, and we have climate migration as well as um, massive drug addictions and then a growing um, gap in wealth. And um, personally, I believe that those numbers are gonna continue to grow. So even if we were seeing um, people placed over and you would think that we would start to see some of that kind of returned back or leveled out, 
I personally think that we're just gonna start to see those numbers really go if we continue to cut social programs that we're seeing and housing programs and running out of money left and right. So to me, that is our sense of urgency around coming up with the unique and uh, innovative programs to deal with the unhoused. And I think I think I heard something in what you were saying, Danny, that that maybe I can provide some input on a little because um, Greg Harms was one of the people who who really worked hard on getting Housing First started. He runs the shelter, and they did not expect, but it did happen that when people first got housed, the increase in their medical costs went sky high because people had been living outside for a long time and had chronic health problems rather than emergent health problems, but it calmed down um, after a while, like once those issues were addressed, and that is uh, that is something they now take into consideration. There's gonna be that cost of people being homeless for a long time and having chronic illness. Right. Might I interject really quick? I just wanted to offer, so that Housing and Human Services with the city has is a leader in the homelessness work across the county, and I think it would probably be very beneficial to this board to have our team that focuses a lot on, uh, their work is focused on this area, to come and present to the Housing Advisory Board so you can hear more about the type of statistics and the the amount of data that we have, it's its all very real time and very specific to our Boulder community, as well as some of the work that's being done. I do know at the city council retreat, there is an interest, there is an interest on city council's board to kind of open up the conversation to look at, you know, out of the box strategies to address um, the needs of our um, individuals who are experiencing homelessness, all the things that Mason just mentioned and they will be reaching out to the Housing Advisory Board to weigh in on that conversation. So I might suggest that we work with your chair to schedule time for um, Kurt and Vicki Ebner to come and speak to you just about this, that scope of our work. I was gonna say, is that the, the one or the 1 1.5 that would be coming? <laughs> The 1.5. They were saying that they had, we were talking about resources at the retreat and they said they had 1.5 people working on the, the <laughs> unhoused and I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else from up here? Um, I had a question also if anybody in the audience, do we have any extra copies of this, of the trans report? I brought about 50. There they are, yep. right. Okay, because if anybody out there wants it and then Along with Judy's thing, if just if you have a question out there that you want to throw to Chris, our time is a little running short for his presentation, but um, we could take it. Okay, so we're good up here. Thank you so much. Yeah, Chris, thanks a bunch. Good work. Thank you. Yeah, that's really helpful. Oh, I have one last little quick one actually. The data that you used to put this together is that something that not myself, but somebody who's very numbers intense could get access to, Thank you. is that yeah, public? A couple years ago, we created a three layer deep uh, website. So if, if you just Google Boulder County Trends, you'll see all of the indicators and more. Um, we don't publish all of them in the magazine. We just follow what's new and persistent. But right. yes, for a data person or a nonprofit or government person wanting to go after a grant, it's all open source. They're beautifully done charts. Please steal them for your purposes. Right. And there's mm -hmm. discussion of each statistic on the website as well. Beautiful. Yep. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. So much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so swapping out. We'll switch now, and Danica is. Oh yeah, at least I Danica Powell is going to speak to us about the. No, no, no. Home wanted campaign. Oh, it's the Powell Oh. She's got a flash drive. She's got a flash drive. person? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> By the way, Danica, everybody else is smiling. You started on those photos. <laughs> started letting everybody else smile. I didn't tell you not to smile. No, I, they did. I had to retake it like five times because I kept smiling. Dave Korak's not smiling. He's on the bottom. There you go. Um, <laughs> well, Thank you for having me here tonight, and I'm so excited to follow Chris's presentation because I'm here to talk about solutions in a regional effort that is 
um, really solution driven and we want to activate the Housing Advisory Board to be um, home team champions for us and get out in the community. So uh, I know I spoke with Jock earlier just to understand what you've learned about the Regional Housing Partnership. Um, and so I'm gonna skip over a lot of the data and the partnership information because I think you may have a background on that and really focus on where we're at now and activating this campaign and initiative, not just in Boulder, but Boulder County. Um, so about um, in 2016, 2017, nine jurisdictions came together and started working together on regional housing, which is really exciting. Um, I started working on this project about six months ago to initiate this Home Wanted campaign, but the idea is that we're all working together towards affordable housing. Um, as we know, the, there's um, our data is 5% of existing housing in Boulder County is affordable. I think we could argue about the numbers all day long, but the goal of the partnership is to increase that to 12%, and that means 18,000 units region-wide. Um, again, reiterating some of the data about how many cost burden families there are in this county and um, what we wanna do to solve that. As many of you know up here that um, housing, high housing costs um, impact everything um, in people's lives and uh, stable homes um, impact that, and Chris went over that in great detail. Um, what's important about this Boulder County Regional Housing Plan is it's a multifaceted in each jurisdiction. So we're talking Longmont, Louisville, Ward, Jamestown, Boulder, Boulder County, Lafayette, Superior, um, and we're hoping to get Erie on board. They're the last one out in the county. And what we are, every group, every jurisdiction within the partnership has different priorities. For some it's home preservation, some it's deed restrictions, some it's ADUs and tiny homes. Some it's construction of new units. So this is really custom tailored and um, there's, uh, there's a hard copy of the plan if you're interested online, um, just to really see what each jurisdiction is committed to individually because each of them has said we're gonna do this a different way but we're all working together. And I think that's what's really exciting about this. We're not, it's not one size fits all. And so um, what I have been doing is really meeting with all the different jurisdictions and really understanding what they're working on, how we can build advocacy and so that's why I'm here tonight, is to continue the advocacy work in Boulder. Um, I was at, actually somebody from my team was at Boulder, um, or City of Longmont and City Council last night, speaking at Open Comment and doing this similar presentation. So we're on a pretty big road show, trying to get to as many people as we can to really share the initiative. I think one of the big components of this is storytelling. And so we have made this video from an event we did with CU called Squeezed Out. And we um, did, uh, this is um, a video showing some of the initial storytelling work that we've been working on. And you will recognize at least one of the faces in this video. Crying. Minimize the PowerPoint and pull up the. Uh, mm. You hit escape. Could do you maybe pop over and see? Yeah. Mm. Okay, so. Boy. Really bad. <laughs> okay, sorry about the delay, guys. You don't want to open. Try. It. Oh, here we go. voices and stories, narratives that we don't typically hear around the affordable. Worker. 
Stables of Learning, a 30 year K 12 position as a teacher and an administrator. back to and So that video is, is really what we're doing here is storytelling. And we heard from Chris Barge that that's one of the key um, things that the Community Trends Report did. And this presentation will review high level findings from a Boulder County needs assessment related to system <laughs> services and supports for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Spell. Boulder County. Oh. <laughs> there you go. Whoops. <laughs> There's more videos if you're interested on the Boulder County Housing and Human Services website. <laughs> um, so I think what we're really trying to do is elevate the stories of our community and make them, connect them to solutions. And so um, on homewanted.org, we really encourage you to join our home team. There's an onboarding survey to really I identify what your talents are, what your skills are. Obviously, everybody sitting here is very interested in housing and understands it deeply, but we're looking for people who are artists or creators or um, you know, bakers and who wants to be part of this movement. I think what else is really unique and wonderful about this is that we are um, working with our partners. So we're working with the Chamber and the Boulder County, um, the Boulder Together Initiative. We're working with the East County Housing Coalition, which um, has just formed in the East County to really advocate around affordable housing. We're working in the faith-based community, and um, we really want to work with you tonight. So if we got a hashtag, Home Wanted Boco, we have the Home Wanted signs. You, you'll see a lot of those in pictures. You can see our survey, really getting people to think about their story and what is unique. Everybody has a housing story, um, and so we want people to connect that to solutions. Um, so what we would love to ask for you tonight is to get those signs, put them up in your workplace or your community, carry them around with you, take pictures, hashtag continue the conversation that I know you're already having, advocate for policies that affect change, um, and participate in upcoming events. And a couple that are coming up that we're really excited about is Making a Place for All. It's the Faith Communities Creating Housing Justice. Um, this is, uh, is focused on mobile home parks in, in preservation in Lafayette, but it's being held in Boulder. And I know that the city's very involved in this, but it's at the Unitarian Universalist Church. Um, we invite all of you to join that conversation. It's really about how the faith-based community is making change um, throughout the region. Uh, we're gonna do some really fun, I think, grassroots events at Boulder Arts Week. We're working very closely with the Arts Commission. They've taken up housing as a priority as well. So it's not just the Housing Advisory Board who's thinking about housing. We're gonna do a summit of Latinx leaders um, in April and we'll share that with you. So we've been doing a lot of outreach in the Latin Latinx community and I think that will be a really wonderful event. It will be a Spanish first event. Um, and I think will be probably held in Longmont and it'll probably be the third week in April. So I'm happy to share that date, um, but we're really excited about that. And what I was just hoping to leave a few minutes just to talk about how you've seen some of the activation we're doing. We rely on your, your networking, your ideas, where we should be in the community, how we partner. We don't want to compete with all of the other good people in this community doing housing. And so we're really working on that. Funding is a huge priority, um, as well as policy. So what funding ideas might there be that we can take to the Regional Housing Partnership and our partners? 
what can we bring back from our regional partners? Um, wh what is Longmont doing around ADUs? What is Lyons doing around tiny homes? We can bring and bridge all of that informational gap with resources and speakers and events. And um, who else should we be partnering with? I mentioned the arts community, the Latinx community, the faith community. Who else do you think we should be talking to? And how can you be an advocate for this movement? Um, this is really, to me, very exciting because of the regional nature of it. It's not just Boulder's problem to solve, um, but it's all of ours. And so um, I just want to open up the conversation for ideas or questions. I'll admit I am not a data-driven person, so um, I can get back to you. But I'm really looking for where can we do storytelling? How do we connect these two solutions? And any ideas about who we should be working with in our community? We want to Thank do the doc. Yeah, thanks for that. And um, I mean, to that question, I think one of the things that I thought of earlier also is just looking towards our teacher community. We talked about artists, teachers, the city employees. There are all these groups that we know are, you know, really heavily burdened by this housing issue and to get those voices on board. So I, I just throw those ideas out right off the top. Um, the other piece that I think is so critical is this narrative component. Um, as I feel like we all have this sense, there's this kind of general discussion around it, but I feel like we don't talk to each other about it very much. In other words, do I talk to people? Does Mason talk to people? Do Who talks to each other about how they're in being impacted by this in the community? Because it's a much larger percent of the, of the community, obviously, as we've seen here tonight. Um, and so those discussions, Danica, and, and you trying to create those discussions and have that storytelling, I think, is critically important to the mission of, of addressing this. So thank you so much. and. I know that I, for one, on HAB, am super excited to have your help in finding, being the nexus mm -hmm. for what we can do here in Boulder. And uh, I, I think we want to make it easy. So, I, for example, I sat down at a, a, a restaurant and I was picking up a to-go and someone who's picking up to-go and I just, we st brought, sparked up a conversation and that woman's like, I have to hurry because I... And painting the condo that my tenants just purchased for me and my husband because we kept the rent down for 20 years and we allowed them to buy it and in that story came out just in a two-minute conversation and I wanted to capture it I wanted you know so I think that's what we want to do because out of that story is a solution what if we got, got landlords together to talk about what it could look like if we kept rents down and empowered people to save money and not be cost burdened um, that, that's, a, that's a group of folks that we could convene around a solution without a policy change, or, or perhaps there's a tax change, I don't know, but I think that two second, we hope that you'll be encouraged to take a video, take an audio, take a picture, and hashtag it, and just, and because to me there was a solution in that quick conversation. Yeah, yeah. so I think coupling off uh, Jock's point about teachers, I think schools and, and the children in schools, because what you see more and more um, as this housing issue grows are the impacts on the children who ostensibly would be growing up here. But, you know, there are a lot of kids, you see it more and more every year. My, my son's in, in middle school and kids who are moving further and further away from Boulder still going to school over here. You know, they used to live here. They don't live here anymore. Um, and it's that's a very much growing issue. And it's very much an issue that reflects towards our future. and you know, how are we gonna address this from a long-term perspective and the effects that it has on, you know, it's always compelling to hear from children, you know, and there, there are a lot of kids that are coming in with their parents 30 minutes every morning and then hanging around until they get done with work and then going back out to, I mean, there's, there's one kid in um, my son's class that lives in Thornton. It's pretty far, mm. <laughs> right? And so, um, you know, I think that's another part of that where there's a, a lot of stories to be told, you know, for that medium. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, Mason. Um, and just when you're answering or anything, Danica, I don't know if your mic's on or if you're up close to it. 
Um, just so for our audience that's listening. Thank you. <laughs> um, Not used to sitting up here. <laughs> you know, I've been doing a lot of thinking around this subject as well as rents keep going up, et cetera, because I've owned a couple of houses here, and now I, ch I, at a certain point, I choose to rent. You guys know my story about wanting to live tiny and, and reducing all my stuff. But I think there's something interesting, too, when we talk about our stories, which we were talking about in the back just before this, which is shame. Um, that feeling of, like, as rents are going up, as the costs of things are going up, we're not talking about the fact of how hard it gets and, um, like, there's got to be something wrong with me that even though I'm, I, uh, like I said, own a hair salon and I'm um, working X amount of hours, but I'm being outpaced so much by the rent that what am I doing wrong? What, why am I not staying ahead? And it's hard to talk about that or when you have to leave the school systems or, you know, I've been here for 26 years and how come everybody else around me is like throwing down solid cash to buy these houses and to do these things and and I think having honest conversations about that is also really important and like Malik was saying um, for you at the community, a lot of my friends live in co-ops and that's their most discouraging um, part of their story is uh, we can't build wealth. It's hard enough to build wealth anywhere in the country right now outside of smaller, um, more rural regions, but building wealth and the, way th the, the wealth gap is widening and um, people are being left behind. So it's just, it's an interesting story to be talking about and I know I don't often share the shame piece. Thank you. Judy, go ahead, and Julia. Uh, you've probably already got this on your list, but the Area Agency on Aging has a housing um, group um, that might be good, and there's sort of a marriage potential between, I, I meet a lot of older adults who bought a house in Boulder when it was affordable in the 50s, 60s, 70s, whatever, and now they're alone, kids are grown, spouse is gone, and um, are really afraid that they're not gonna be able to pay their property taxes anymore as, as costs keep escalating and have rooms in their house. And that's, that's perhaps another marriage between people looking for places and people who have places but don't know what to do. Uh, and then the one other question I wanted I ha question I want to ask you is maybe after you're done with your question is could you talk a little bit about what the fundraising, uh, where you are in fundraising, like what that looks like? What are some of your thoughts on that? Selena. So uh, my, uh, I, and I don't know if this is appropriate or not from a partnership standpoint, but to tie back to Chris's statistic that we have 3.5 jobs for every adult that live in Boulder. That lives in Boulder. Um, who are those employers? And you know, I think about all the hospitality-based businesses. That's the industry that I'm in. Uh, that employ low-wage workers that serve the community. They're that $25,000 employee that serves the uh, the higher-paid worker. And engaging the business community. Um, to talk about their stories about how their employees are impacted um, and what ideas they might have to help offset the, the housing burden because we do have a jobs housing imbalance mm -hmm. here and that's a big part of why we have these problems to begin with. Juliet, I would add too that, um, I don't know if you guys saw or if you follow her on Twitter, but I posted Noodles and Company was closed the other day because they literally didn't have staff. Yeah, and I, and I know three restaurants downtown that have a thousand dollar signing bonuses for um, bus boys. That's how hard it is to get those the individuals, you know, at the, at some of those lower paid wage paying jobs. The Noodles and Company on Alpine, where my son worked for his last year of high school, was staffed almost entirely with high school students, mm -hmm. almost entirely. 
thank you. And to get back to your question, the, fun, the fundraising component is look, it's being looked at at a regional scale and it's being looked at by the county commissioners and the leaders in our community and they're really evaluating how to tie housing and transportation and looking at the regional housing. So from a very large scale, it's being looked at. Again, that's I think the benefit of the partnership is um, it's, it's all of us and it's Longmont. They have a very different housing problem. Um, but it, and it may not be as related to jobs as here, but it certainly, they are all related. So that that is being looked at, at by big decision makers in our community, and you may hear more about that in months to come. Um, certainly, um, you know, one of the examples that Karen um, Ronnie works, who is in the city of Longmont, talks about is after the flood, $28 million was infused into the community in flood recovery and a thousand units were built. And so there is a direct correlation with money and being able to build units. The goal of the housing partnership is 18,000 units, and now that's preservation and new units. It's not all new units, but, um, and then, uh, but alongside that comes policy and advocacy around different projects. Um, one success story that I think is really interesting is in Lafayette, Willoughby Corners is a affordable housing project. Um, the faith community got very involved in that project and brought a lot of people out in support, and that really changed the discussion around a housing project in Lafayette. And so I think that there's also that piece of really activating people, even if it's not in your community, maybe we go speak um, at a di in a different um, jurisdiction about how this worked in our community. Maybe somebody's tackling a housing first project or something like that. So it's, it's policy, advocacy, storytelling, and funding, they all. I just want to add one comment around the funding piece. So Kurt and myself both sit on the steering committee of the Regional Housing Partnership and work very closely with Danica and the team on this. And one of the things I just wanted to clarify is when we're looking at um, funding resources to support the creation and preservation of housing, we're looking at a variety of resources. So I think people are quick to talk about taxes and ballot measures and things of that sort, but we're really kind of blowing it wide open to try to look at as many creative options as we can to create the resources we need to leverage the dollars that are needed that Danica was speaking to of bringing in federal resources, state level resources, things of that sort. Um, so just know that it's, there's a lot of different avenues that we're pursuing on that front. And I had a follow up question, I'm sorry. Um, in terms of the hospitality, I know that the chamber is really working with probably larger employers and so do you have any ideas on on working with more of the hospitality and for these, for more of the wage earners, the service workers in our community. I think we're working closely with the chamber, but I wanna make sure that they're reaching those folks as well. Well, if it's for storytelling, I mean, I, if, if you talk to wait staff or cooks at any of the restaurants in town, a lot of them are commuting from pretty far away places and they work non-traditional hours, so the impacts of commuting are often less than the traditional nine to five commuter, so um, they have that, uh, but it is a struggle, and so I don't know how you get access to those employees um, through, you know, through the chamber if they can help facilitate that, but that, that would be an, you know, an interesting place for at least the storytelling piece, and then to understand, you know, what the management challenges are, of how do you attract and retain talent um, to serve uh, in these establishments, which Boulder is known for. I mean, it's become a hub for people to come and, and dine and, and, and recreate, but just keep that staffed is, is a challenge. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I, uh, one thing that kind of strikes me with this, and you may have implicitly uh, mentioned this at some point, but uh, it seems like there's opportunities to tap into folks whose voices aren't often heard in community dialogues that we have about things like area plans, sub-community planning, all the kinds of things that kind of affect the housing landscape in Boulder. And I just wonder if you thought about using uh, these connections to help bring additional voices into the converse, community conversation as we work on, on effective community outreach and getting everybody at the table. Yeah, I think that's one of our primary goals is to both um, reach out to communities that aren't particularly involved in housing discussion um, and also empower people to have their voice amplified in this discussion. And so that, again, we'll be looking um, for ways to do that. But I think one idea I think we discussed was working with Modus Theater and really doing this storytelling where you allow people to juxtaposition their experience with maybe a policy maker or, or decision maker. And so I think there's a lot of really powerful ways that we can do that. 
Um, the Arts Commission, as I mentioned, is very, very interested in being creative around this, and that was really exciting to me. Um, I've met with their two, two of their commissioners and Matt Chazansky and David Farnham. And so, you know, housing, they've been very specific about what the artistic community needs from housing, from a housing perspective. They've actually done their own studies and, da and pulled their own data. Um, and I, I don't know if you've seen any of those reports, but it might be very interesting to you because it's very specific about the type of housing that artists in this community are craving or would need um, for creative work and for housing. And that, that sharing that with as many people as possible is really, um, I think, important. And so I'm happy to share some of that additional information with you because I think, um, to me, that's, you know, the artists are talking about it, but how do we create that voice? And, and maybe we'll do something really fun around Boulder Arts Week. Danica, can you talk a little bit about what you're gonna do with all this information when you're done? <laughs> um, well, this is a long-term strategy. Uh, I will, I've been um, working on it for at least three years, and so the, the goal is to continue to keep the partnership engaged, so the regional partners, so bringing this information to them, um, sharing the information out, and you know, continuing to tell the story and, um, and, be, and help the decision makers and the steering committee, which are members of all of the different jurisdictions, continue to you know, make decisions and, and advocate in their own communities. I think one of the key goals is just building that partnership right now. And like I've mentioned, Lo Longmont and Boulder are very active in the partnership. We're really, um, I'm meeting with several new city council members in Louisville and Lafayette and really trying to build that, that alliance. Um, so that's a big part of it as well. Yeah, Kristen, if you have anything to add. I guess I would just add, so one of the great things about having Danica and Trestle joining our team working on this is we have, for the past three years, it's been representatives from the various jurisdictions that have been leading this work. And we, we are so mired down in that like technical and financial work of this that it's really hard to get out and to get the voices of the community and to raise that awareness and to learn those stories. And so to have Danica and her team and their talents bringing that to it, it's really just widening the conversation. So we're really elevating it um, so it's to a wider audience and really, really making it so it's very impactful. So it's actually a perfect um, matching of skills because we're able to work on the policies and the financial resources and investments and things of that sort while they're really um, engaging the public in a very positive way in furthering this work. Yeah, I mean, we hope there's some long format goals. You've seen some of the shorter format. Um, Laura from Pivot is here. She's helping us with the videos and some of the social media. Um, but we also want to work with KGNU, and we actually have a really good, really, we, one of the persons on our team, Marina Lagrave, has a good relationship with Telemundo. So we're really working towards a larger format segment on television and radio and podcast and so again any ideas you have on who we should be talking to who wants who we can feed stories to and create um, information that's that's relevant and, and compelling that's that's what we're trying to do so I think that there's some also really exciting things in the works that I hope you'll be hearing about um, and there's also some really simple things. We'll have a postcard, and I have some Home Wanted signs for you tonight, but we have a postcard with Home Wanted, and when we meet with people, we're gonna really just encourage them to jot a letter to their elected official and pop it in the mail. You know, so while we're doing larger storytelling, we wanna just make it easy for people to reach um, some of their own decision making makers in their community. Did you have something? No, nope. you're leaving. Um, yeah, thanks so much for this update and again I love the fact that we're looking at representing the narrative of Boulder's story in a holistic manner and not just having the narrative of Boulder be the perception mm -hmm. I think that exists for it so I think that's really powerful and yeah thanks for coming and presenting to us and I know that we will be in touch and I will probably send you a link to our website and the follow-up materials that I talked about. So thank you so much for allowing me to come here tonight. Awesome. Thanks, Danica. <coughs> Elena, we can... Are we going to... Not that I need a break anymore, but... I was going to do after Elena. Okay. We'll do... Yeah, if that sounds okay to everybody, I think after Elena gives her presentation to us, we can ask her some questions, then we'll take a break and get into the rest of the agenda. 
I don't know anymore. I was like, yeah. <laughs> no. I you break it. Seven o'clock. I don't know. Lost me. I'm I'm <laughs> my phone. <laughs> but I drink a. And Elena, you'll have to excuse me. I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself because this is such a rushed engagement. <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> That's totally fine. Um, thank you for having me here this evening. My name is Elena Wilkin. I'm the executive director of a statewide membership organization called Housing Colorado, and we represent the um, vast diversity of organizations and industries that are engaged in the development, construction, siting, development, construction, maintenance, and rehabilitation of affordable housing. We have about 300 organizational members. A number of them are here in Boulder. Um, we have two, we do two things, like any good membership organization, we advocate on behalf of our um, interests at the state and federal level, and then we do a lot of professional development, otherwise known as parties. So we throw a lot of really good parties <laughs> for the affordable housing community, um, because really it's all about building relationships, so um, we facilitate that. But tonight, I'm here to talk to you about state policy, and I'm a little sad to come after Danica, because I do not have fun videos, I don't have people smiling, um, I just have a lot of really heavy policy. So um, I'm going to go pretty quick. I'll give you a very brief overview of the session itself so far. Um, and then the housing specific bills that we've seen actually drop and then ones that we um, think might be coming. So um, I can either go each bill singly or I can kind of do them all as clumps and then we can talk about them afterwards if you guys have questions. And then at the very end, I want to just give a real quick update on an anti-growth, statewide anti-growth ballot initiative that we might be looking at in November. So um, if that works for you guys. So um, first of all, I'm gonna talk about funding because we always need to know about money. Um, so anyone who was paying attention last year know we had incredible success. We secured two new sources of funding for affordable housing that we're going to run through the Division of Housing gen General Grant Program. I know Boulder's gotten, Boulder and Boulder County have gotten money through that program before. One was unclaimed property, one was vendor fees. We can go into the technical details. I'll give you the punchline. It doesn't look like we're gonna get either one of those funding sources because we are, again, in a Tabor cap year. So any new money that comes into the budget just gets <coughs> refunded out the back. So it's kind of a... <laughs> tube of toothpaste with a hole in it. So um, all that hard work that we did last year looks like it may not result in anything. Nonetheless, we're gonna proceed with um, building policy work with the Division of Housing to make sure that money gets out into the communities with transparency and efficacy. <laughs> so that's kind of the funding front. Um, and I can go back and touch on that if there's questions about it. Um, so Housing Colorado sits in a really unique position because we represent both those who are seeking affordable housing and I should back up just one step. We do housing the spectrum. So we go from homelessness to home ownership, right? So we're kind of covering all the housing pieces all the way across Colorado. So um, since we represent those who are seeking housing and those who advocate on behalf of those who are seeking housing and those who manage property, we run into some landlord tenant issues. Um, so last year there was a whole um, like four or five bills that kind of directly addressed landlord tenant issues, both in rental and mobile home parks, some of which we supported, some of which we monitored because the tricky situation that we were in. We're back again this, this year. We have an interesting bill that would suppress eviction records um, so that people who have been not all the way fully evicted but all the way up until the filing of the court documents, that kind of ends up as a red letter um, and it's really hard to get housing once this is on your record and so the, the um, legislation would suppress that, um, that particular piece of your record so it would no longer show up when you're trying to apply for housing. There's a source of income bill. Denver did this a couple years ago. So currently landlords can exclude tenants who use vouchers, um, social security, social security disability, um, alimony payments, those can all be excluded when you're trying to apply for a house, rental housing. So this legislation would prohibit that. So all sources of income would be considered eligible. Um, there's one on late fees, so there's a, we have some really lovely national uh, property managers who have come into Colorado and have instigated a system called churning, where if you're late on your rental fee, they are allowed to charge up to 90% of your rent for being late, and they can continue to charge that month over month. So we have tenants who are getting really far behind really, really fast. So this bill would cap those late fees um, and uh, uh, cap it on a per month basis. So we're watching that one. 
Um, there's one that um, would prohibit landlords from uh, asking about immigration status of people who are applying for housing. This is real sticky for us because all of the federal, any housing that's built with federal dollars <laughs> has to ask. <laughs> so we're working with the bill sponsor. We totally support the intention of this bill. It just puts my housing authorities and, and my other um, affordable housing properties in a sticky situation. So we're working on that one. Um, and then finally, there's a really interesting one that would prohibit discrimination based on traits that are um, indicative of particular races. This is really more geared toward the school systems, but housing does get swept up in it. Those are already protected status, protected classes. It just kind of refines further, um, you know, prohibiting discrimination on specific race traits. So those are kind of the, the package of landlord-tenant bills that we're looking at. Um, I know I went super fast, if there's any questions on any of those? Hopefully this is what you guys wanted from me. Um, then I have a whole list of kind of odd bag stuff. And I'm going to say, I came into housing, um, this is my second session. Before this, I was working on transit and transportation issues. Um, so this is a really interesting policy field to play in because there's so many pe pieces come at you from all different, I'm uh, sure you guys know, because um, you're just dealing with that nexus between economics and housing and real estate and labor and, you know, all, all those different pieces coming together. So again, kind of a quick rundown of um, just some of the smaller bills, and then I'll hit the really big ones at the end so you can save your applause for the end. Um, <laughs> there's another bill we had this last year um, incentivizing job developments in rural areas. Um, this is a Republican bill, so it has already been assigned to the Kill Committee. We actually really like it because housing is listed as one of the eligible recipients. Um, I don't think it's going to go very far this year. Um, we still really like it, though. There is a proposal to um, the senior property tax exemption to allow people who have had to move because of a medical condition to still be eligible for that exemption. So this is a little tiny piece of a much, much bigger conversation that we're having around that senior property tax exemption. Uh, I know this is on record, I probably shouldn't say this. <laughs> it's a really well-intentioned policy with really horrible consequences. <laughs> so we're all trying to look at it and figure out, is this the best way? Is there a way we can means test? Is there a way that, why 10 years? Where did that come from? What is it actually doing to the real estate market? There's some people who contend that seniors aren't downsizing because of this, and other people say that's not, that's ridiculous, that's not why. So anyway, this is the very first, I think, nibble at that much larger conversation around that particular unique uh, Colorado Paul. I've asked my other state partners, no one else has a policy that looks quite like this, so i love to be special. <laughs> um, there's a bill, 1009, which we really, really like. This has to do with expanding the ability to access supportive services, most specifically in rural areas, but I think a lot of um, suburban areas also right now are running into really, so with all this new money that was supposedly coming into the Division of Housing, what we heard over and over and over again this summer was, that's great, we, have, we don't have the capacity. We can build the housing, we can't take care of the people who are in it. Um, wraparound services, supportive services, permanent supportive housing, all those things are pretty incredibly intensive in terms of resources, either from your nonprofit community or your faith-based community. So this would be a capacity building within those communities to, to be able to access these funds. So we really like that one. There is some talk about um, <coughs> messing around with a private activity bond process in Colorado, which is a way that we fund a large chunk of our housing. Uh, most people in Colorado really like the way it's done now. It's split between equally between CHAFA, the Colorado Housing and Finance Authority, and our local governments. And then if local governments have excess bond, they can give it back to the state. And it's kind of allocated, you know, sort of on a, in an informal way. So this would change the allocation process. I know the Colorado Municipal League is watching this really, really closely. So if those of you who are engaged in private activity bond activity, um, those are our partners that we're working with on that particular piece. And finally, this is a fascinating piece of legislation I just got off the phone with the bill sponsor on. Um, this would require the state to spend 10% of all that money that we hope to get on home ownership programs instead of rental. So the idea is to kind of, we've been really heavily focused in Colorado, certainly from the state level, on the neediest, um, the lowest income and the neediest people with disabilities, seniors, um, people transitioning out of the justice system, 
um, foster care, you know, children transitioning out of foster care, um, and this would request the state to kind of shift their focus more toward home ownership and I wouldn't say leave behind that other population, but maybe allocate more of the money toward ownership programs rather than rental programs. So. Um, that's an interesting bill. It's going to put Housing Colorado kind of a sticky situation just because we represent such a wide spectrum. So we'll see where that one goes. Um, the one that I promised Jacques that we would hit on with you guys, um, there is a proposal to back up like, what are we at now, 19 years ago when the Telluride Supreme Court case came down that said that local authorities, I'm getting some nods, this is awesome, could not use inclusionary zoning in their sort of toolkit to incentivize affordable housing. So CML is running a bill. This came out of the whole rent control conversation from last year, which um, Speaker Becker has completely squashed, and I think we're really all really happy that she has done that. But this would be to carve out inclusionary zoning from the rent control conversation and say, in point of fact, inclusionary zoning is not rent control. It just allows cities and counties to set aside um, developments that they've approved and a certain percentage would have to be affordable. So um, she is still resistant. I think you guys are sort of victims of, or were the victims of your success because your cash in lieu program is so successful. Um, her contention is we don't need this because look at what Boulder has done and how great they are and why can't everybody do this? and you know, <laughs> so I don't know any of you very well yet, so I won't go down those paths, but that's the kind of conversation we're having um, around inclusionary zoning. And a lot, uh, interestingly enough, a lot of my county partners um, are super excited because they are now being asked to play in housing. And I know Boulder, Boulder County has been playing a long time in this area, but a lot of other counties, this is brand, brand new to them, and they don't have any tools. They have no authority. They have no taxing ability. Like, they're just kind of stuck, and yet they're being asked by developers to make big decisions and by their constituencies. Why can't I live in Larimer County anymore? Why can't I live in Weld County? Why can't I live in, you know, wherever? So um, that's going to be um, a really interesting conversation. It may not come out this year as an actual bill. It may be one of those bills that takes two to three years to bake. Um, so that is, um, that's that one. And I think that is my short list of specifically housing related bills at the state level. Any questions so far? I was hearing some group, I'm not sure where I even heard this from, um, some discussion around the state picking up occupancy limits. Are you talking about like short term rental? No. Um, oh. I feel like Adam was talking about it and it got moved to this, the uh, state conversation, but that because we were home ruled or something that um, it needed to, I, I don't even know. I mean, if you're not hearing anything about it, then maybe it's just something that's being kicked around here. It's, it, you know, and we still have um, two more weeks until bills can drop. So it's totally possible that things will, or we have late bills too. So it's totally possible that things could develop for sure. Mm. I have a quick comment and then a question. Um, it's really interesting to me that a few of the bills coming up are things that have already happened in Boulder. Like we already have an ordinance that was passed a year ago maybe about no discrimination for sources of income. Mm -hmm. So Section 8 housing, you can't be yep. discriminated against or for immigration status. Mm -hmm. And so that's cool. Yeah. You know? um, but the question I had is I, what I didn't understand and what you said is the status of all these. Right now they're being presented and so um, it's changing day by day. I mean, so this session, so I don't know if you guys, those of you who follow politics, so last session, um, the, the beginning, if I had been here last year at this time, I would have had like two bills to talk about. Like they just got this super slow start and then they got completely mired in vaccinations and death penalty and there was like an education. I mean, it just got sticky right out of the gate. So we didn't hit our peak until, gosh, it was like April. Um, so this year, Wednesday, January 6th um, or 8th, 200 bills dropped. And usually we hit about 500 through the whole session. So the, Dem uh, the Democrats have committed firmly to keeping the calendar and pushing things through. And so we've had this huge push of bills and it's starting to level off a little bit. Um, so just a totally different feel of the session and um, we'll 
see how the Republicans do. I mean, last year, you remember, we got into the speed reading of the bills and the Supreme Court decision. I mean, it just got so ugly. So we're hoping we don't go there this year. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I'll, uh, one comment, uh, I'm, a, I'm the planning board uh, representative here and I, uh, we, we don't have enough tools in our tool chest. <laughs> so um, <laughs> please, uh, we need to get to 15% by 2035 and we need every, uh, every movable piece. Um, I, I can see pulling um, rent control out um, as, a, as a, you know, that's, a, that's a maybe a difficult uh, issue, uh, but um, is that is there still a conversation to be had on rent control as as an op, as a as something in the mix? I would say politically no. Mm -hmm. um, I think the speaker, with her experience in development, has has, has found that to be unhelpful, um, and it's really mixed across the board. Um, some people think it's the best piece of policy ever. A lot of people who work on regional housing fear that it just pushes the problem farther out. You know, because if you're just drawing lines, you're just gonna go across the border. And my developers tell me I will just find a, a piece of land that doesn't have rent control on it, right? And so, you know, embedded in our housing conversation is the transportation conversation. So anything you're pushing out is gonna increase congestion and increase infrastructure, you know, so, I think as a policy tool, it is to be wielded with great discretion. Mm -hmm. And I am concerned, I think I can say that here, that there are communities in Colorado that are less sophisticated than Boulder and would, um, you know, might do some damage if they tried to wield something like that without, mm -hmm. um, about thoughtfulness. I know it's difficult, but I just, <laughs> I'm always, I'm always, yeah. so because the rental properties are harder here for, for us to deal with. Yes. You know, the ownership, yep. governance. Work are very easy, but okay. Yeah, no, I, I hear you for sure. Thanks a lot. Mason, did you have another question? No. Or are you just running out of time? Or something? Yeah. You can. I have one more question. I, I'm just curious. You said there was a particular bill going to the place to the committee where bills die. Yes. And I think you said it was about incentivizing rural areas. Yeah. And and I, I'm just curious. To me, that seems to make good sense for cities to incentivize rural areas because it would take some of the building, some of the pressure of the building crises off of urban areas if rural areas were incentivized. So why do, why is that going to the place? What am I not getting about because it? Because it's a Republican bill. Oh, simply that. Mm -hmm. I see. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, that was the one I saw that I was also interested in. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lovely bill. It's been up twice now. Last year we really liked it too. Yeah. <laughs> Tell Casey I haven't voted Republican since Ronnie. <laughs> um, Do you mind asking one more? Go ahead. Uh, this is just um, way out there, I know, but um, does anyone ever talk about um, the progressive uh, property taxation uh, mechanisms? Because uh, uh, it seems to me that that's an area of rich for exploration uh, to try to take the burden off the lower end on property taxes. Uh, for both rental and ownership properties. You know, the only conversation I've heard around that is to um, equalize mill levies across the state. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. conversation, as you can imagine, died early, early right. on. <laughs> so, right, right, right. Uh, <laughs> not quite what you're talking about, but no, that's a that's a sacred cow, honestly, it's, it's in Colorado politics. One, right? Yep, yeah. Thank you. Uh, is there any initial discussion about what might be coming down the pike for uh, in terms of referendums or initiatives. Oh, they just teed me up. <laughs> 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 yes, um, so there has been a ballot initiative filed and it went through Tidal Board, so um, the proponent is out gathering signatures now. It's a statewide ballot, but it would impose a 1% growth cap on 11 front range counties and all the municipalities within those counties. So um, Larimer down to El Paso. Um, in, and it includes Weld, which I think is interesting. So um, it is it is one of the worst pieces of policies I've ever seen written. I'm just gonna say it, like it's poorly written. It does have a carve out for 
um, affordable in senior housing, which would be allowed to grow at 1.15% mm. each year. So <laughs> I know. Um, and you know, honestly, 1%, it sounds like a pretty draconian level. Den Denver's only grown at 1.6% over the last couple years. I mean, it's not, it's not the amount, it's how it would get measured, and it's strictly in residential building permits is, is how they measure it, right? And so you guys sit on boards and planning boards. I mean, to impose that and to measure it and figure out who's responsible and how, how does that get measured. We watched Lakewood just tie themselves up into knots trying to figure out this policy. Um, so that's the first problem. The second problem is it scares away everybody. You know, Lakewood's already had several projects pull out because they passed their ballot initiative. And then a third is that border problem, right? So we, it, it's somehow imagining that we're this, you know, sort of standalone island and I can just see people just jumping across the border and just finding the next piece of land that doesn't have a growth restriction on it. And I mean, you want to talk about sprawl. I mean, that, you know, that just horrifies me. So, um, so Housing Colorado is involved in the anti- anti-growth <laughs> coalition. Um, and we're having a lot of interesting conversations about like, what does growth mean to people? And what, is it, what do they mean when they think about it? And coming from my transportation background, I'm actually firmly convinced this is an anti-traffic bill or uh, ballot measure. Like I think people just measure it by, as Chris said, you know, my, my commute has gotten longer. <laughs> that makes me crankier. I don't want any more people to move to Colorado not ign completely ignoring the fact that we are putting somewhere between 25 and 30,000 new new graduates onto the housing market every single year just internally i mean we're growing internally not just importing people so the whole thing is kind of weird um, but it is moving forward so we are um, we are actively engaged in it because after lakewood passed um, this suddenly became very real and very scary so who's behind it facially and who's behind it really behind it um, so really behind it is a gentleman named Dan Hayes who, out of Golden who has um, a lot of real estate. His wealth comes from real estate. He inherited it. Um, he's second or third generation Coloradan. Um, and he has been back. He's been doing this for a couple years now. This is kind of his third crack at it, I think. Um, and then who's behind him? We, ha we, we haven't seen anything for his particular initiative, but Lakewood, we know it was... Um, uh, <laughs> This breaks along demographic lines, not surprisingly. So wealthy homeowners in, in general support these kind of measures um, and younger um, people do not support them, but they also don't vote. Um, there's also a weird insertion. We have not gone down this path yet in Colorado, but I think this is where it's gonna show up of populism, you know, like kick the bastards out you know, anti-government, they don't know what they're doing, we need to rein them in, you know, so there's definitely some of that national fervor, I think, leaking into our local conversations, and it's kind of showing up in a, in a fairly ugly way, frankly. So it's, it's a loose affiliation of sort of, as is the anti-group. I mean, I, I'm sitting down with people I don't think I ever have sat down with before, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Else? Elena, thank you so much. Thank you. you are so welcome. Thank My you. pleasure. Thank you us in on that. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So let's go ahead and take a five minute break and we'll come back and we'll get into matters from the board. Or I'm sorry, the new business.
So we're good? Yes. Uh, to continue, we have the committee and project liaison reports still on the agenda, but I think in our discussion we feel that there's nothing there really to be had, so we're going to move on. Um, new business. Uh, Judy is going to update us on the listening session in February, and I think we need to talk about and look at the letter and such things. So, so um, the letter had been sent out to everyone, and nobody gave us any feedback, so I hope we can just zip through and have somebody move to vote for the letter and second it and vote. Uh, I move. Uh, we accept the letter. Okay. All right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. In that case, um, is there any discussion around that, or we're going to go straight to a vote? Okay. All those in favor of accepting the letter for the February listening session? It looks like we are unanimous. Okay, and um, Jay wanted me to bring up that the process that the engagement committee follows is one that's already been vetted and approved by the uh, board before. So this letter, not only will I submit and ask them to put it on the Sunday before, which I, they can't guarantee it'll be on that Sunday, but sometime before, but um, I will use that, you know, cuts from it to do emails to places, to groups in Boulder like the Chamber of Commerce or, or Better Boulder, Plan Boulder, and, and any particular groups I can think that would like it, as well as the publicity that um, Zach from City Communications is going to be doing. It's also Be Heard Boulder is going to do a page where they just ask an open-ended question about tiny homes, and we'll see if we get any info from that. Um, Jay also had wanted me to run through the program, just how the program is going to be, and if anyone has any input on that. And that's, it would start with um, the brief video. Um, then it would start with Jay talking about what's going on in Boulder right now. And I don't really know the details, but I'll certainly watch the city council meeting, or maybe you can give us an update. When I'm done with this, about there was a discussion about tiny homes at city council. There was part of the last night they're looking at updating the building code, um, and so it was a part of that conversation. Okay, so jail. So, so Jay, in in his brief notes. So when he returns from Japan, we're going to have him watch that video, <laughs> <laughs> so he can speak to that. <laughs> yes. um, and then we're going to have two different speakers. Um, Jan Burton and I have a phone meeting with her on Friday to discuss um, what she's going to be talking about, which will just be, I think, an overview of different types of tiny homes in town. And then we're going to have um, one or two people from the Tiny Homes Project in Longmont, which is specific to um, housing first sort of situation for veterans in Longmont, where they're gonna have, I don't know, about 25 houses and a main building that will have case management and washer dryer, that sort of thing. And then um, the public input. Um, the only thing I'd like to know, I mean, the thing I'd especially like to know how you feel about is we had that circle seating before down there, and it worked well for another listening session. Do you want to try that again? How are you feeling about that again? And then the feedback part. Um, and then after the session's over, I write up notes of what people said, the different input people gave us, and I summarize it and send it around to all of you to edit any way you want, and then we put that in our minutes, the f as in our information packet the following month. So what was the... I wasn't here for that. So the circle seating, what was that and how, how big is the uh, Let's see. Other people can help me with that. I felt 35 people maybe when we did that. There were the circle. Yeah, the circle was big enough for about 12 people to sit, but then there were people sitting in the back and people sort of came in and out of the circle. And we were all there. And I think Mason led the discussion. Pretty much, did you, Mason or Adam? One of the two of you did, and it was just letting people talk, and is more conversational about people saying how they felt. 
Jason, did you have something you wanted to say? Uh, my only question that I always come back to with our listening sessions is what, what's, the, do we have a defined purpose? What is the reason we're doing this? What do we expect people to get out of it? Right. And on that note, I do want to mention, I had a conversation with um, Kurt briefly. Uh, he was, he expressed concern, and I think this is really relevant considering last night's council meeting and what was discussed there, and I think that was really helpful to, to kind of clarify this piece, but his concern was that we're teeing people up for an expectation that, um, which I think is okay, but I'm, that tiny homes are gonna be sprouting about in Boulder and we're just trying to figure out where and how and we're still a long way from that. So I think he was concerned about the expectation of that. Um, and I do think, Kristen, I don't know if you watched the meeting last night or if you were with it. Um, I did and some of us may, but I think it's worth touching into a little bit just because of the thing that Mason's saying, which is what's our, what's our goal with the listening session? Besides simply taking the input, I think it would be valuable also in this to make sure that we're guiding sufficiently, and Jay's gonna be there, he's gonna give us good input on it, but just the recognition that what council was talking about last night are just changes that have been accepted into the ICC, into the building code. And, uh, and they're all foundation-based. So once you go to wheels, it becomes a, it becomes a mobile home, and the well, building, and there's there's no there is no building code that addresses that. Yes. Yeah, so. so that brings up so many issues. So many things. And that's what I was trying to impart to Judy when we were having this original discussion is that, and you you know as well is that with the whole tiny house discussion, there's there's about four or five big steps that have to occur and. Um, when we started first talking about this listening session, we were in a very different spot than where we're at right now. And where we're at right now for the next step to occur um, is a different conversation. And it's being brought into the, it br being brought into the conversation because a working group's gonna be happening in April around um, potentially a transitional tiny house village for um, the homeless, which would put them back on trailers. So there, to me, with the Kurt's suggestion of managing expectations is that th we're now in a tricky spot. And what I expressed to Judy was that, although I adore Jan, Jan is an investor in storage containers and is very limited in her knowledge on tiny houses and kind of the legal ramifications of where we're at for tiny houses right now. So I'm concerned that the route we're going with um, our listening session isn't gonna serve our needs moving forward depending on what our goal is. And having adequate individuals with experience at the table for anybody that's coming in to help manage those expectations of questions. So I have um, no horse in the race as far as the, what the subject matter is. It's something we all voted on and I am good with branching out. I've already invited some other people who have backgrounds and I noticed that you're on a webpage for having gone to a housing fair or for tiny houses fair in June or July or something like that. And maybe you know- Well actually what I told you was that for three years I toured and spoke about tiny houses in the tiny house community. Um, so yeah. So oh, yeah, maybe you could bring, I mean, I mean, that would all add to the conversation. Yeah, so I think the thing is, and again, again, it comes back to relevancy based on what's happening at council level right now. And, you know, one of my desires is not to be behind the, right. try to be the horse and, and not the mule being dragged behind it. Um, so. The cart. <laughs> no, I don't think the no, 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 the, the cart. <laughs> the, the, mules, the mule's always tied up to the back of the cart. Um, but there are a couple of, I mean, I still think this is a really valuable listening session to have. And I want it, to, you know, I want us to bring it to a place of relevancy. I think pretty much what we have structured is great, but I did want to look at, and I think just over the next month, we can work with this and, and 
just that. It's like, are there other really good people? I looked into Lions a little bit. The reality of what Lions has done is that they're allowing 10 tiny houses within the entire town, um, but they have allowed them to be tie downs and not on foundations. So there's some interesting stuff they've done. It's a very limited scope and reading through it, you know, it's like, okay, there's something there. Um, but as an opportunity to still get some public input, and my thought is like, well, where and how, it really comes down, I think, to zoning to, to a large point, right? Land use, yeah. Land use and zoning. And, and, zoning. And, and that's one thing that I wanted to ask of you tonight, David, is like, where do you see are the points where, you know, we should maybe put some focus in that from, a, from the planning board perspective. If you guys have had any discussions about it, what's going on on your side? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> uh, we've, you know, we've certainly communicated to the council that we would like to see it be a priority. Um, I think that we've, we've suggested that there be a, a trial, uh, you know, like a trial, a place where we could uh, have a, a pilot, pro pilot uh, program. Uh, and, uh, but we haven't, um, seen a lot of traction on, on actually uh, a, a place where we have targeted to look at the land use and the zoning, uh, and, and uh, that, that would have to happen. Uh, and, um, you know, honestly, I, I, I don't have a schedule from staff at this point as to when we might see that. Um, it is encouraging that they're looking at the building codes, because um, I think that means that there's enough energy that they're thinking about it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, uh, I just don't have a timeline at this point. Yeah. So yeah, I, I would, from a planning board perspective, I would um, be, uh, you know, and I could do a little bit more research too before next month too and see if there's anything in addition. But I think it would be good to set expectations that this is, this is a kind of just to get people thinking. It, I think it would be interesting for people to see how other communities have done it and what the different options are and how they look. Uh, so I, 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 I would think that the goal would be more of an education, and then maybe there are some things from the community that would get this group thinking as well. Just to get right on it, I mean, I think I think the mantra's got to be that this is educational, you know, kind of uh, discussion topic of you know trying to mm -hmm. get behind exactly what it is and, and define it, which seems like really enough that we're having trouble right here, right, right now. And I guess along those lines too, then what I'm hearing is now there's kind of a shift towards reconsidering the notion of tiny homes on wheels, tiny homes as tie down, tiny homes on foundations, and then if we are gonna have an educational type of listening session, uh, which I think can be really great, the question is, should we have from those three, because they're, they're very different, different. right? Yeah. And should we have some sort of conversation about those three, because, I mean, they all seem to be up on the, on the runway, so to speak. Yep. Also to tack on to that is that, oh, were you ahead, Terry? No, go ahead. Um, after last night, oh, Sam from Daily Camera headlined saying, tiny house is legal, so yeah. now <laughs> social media <laughs> is rampant with, tiny houses are legal, oh my God. I was in like four different groups this morning, everybody's like, oh my God, where can I put it? Can I get, get to whose house is mine? And I was like, calm down, nothing's changed, you know? And so I think that that's one of my, uh, concerns too about managing expectations that everybody's going to come here and be like, who's got land? Where am I putting this? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. I might offer, um, so staff could take this sometime over the next month to scope out, um, looking at all the different aspects of this, current regulations, how the update last night will affect this type of housing option, as well as at city council, they're looking, one of the city council members or a few of the city council members are looking at this as an option to address individuals experiencing homelessness. So I think it, it's a it's a very rounded conversation that um, if you allow us to kind of take, take a step back and scope out what the conversation and what those parameters are and then bring that back to your chair just to see if that's a good way to um, facilitate that conversation, including maybe examples from Lions, maybe even Denver who's pursuing this type of work as well. Um, there might be some opportunity. So if that's, um, okay with the group, that would be a good conversation for us to have internally. I think that'd be great. Terry, did you have something? Okay. So my only concern with that is the same concern that um, Adam brought up at the retreat, which is yes and um, in the past staff has limited 
itself, like last night when staff told city council that tiny houses um, on trailers are considered vehicles, and they're not. And so my concern is that in the interest that we're getting all the information and that it's not being driven by a perspective. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think there might be an opportunity for staff to work with somebody like yourself or other expertise in the community just to round out the conversation. So maybe that's something that we could have Miss, an offline conversation. Miss, I think probably what's happening here is in the world of tiny houses, you're like way up here and the rest of us are maybe down here, or at least I am anyway. So it'd be great from an educational perspective just to, just to hear about it, right, and talk about it. And what I like about it mm -hmm. is, and this kind of overarching theme is, it's a potential solution, mm -hmm. right? I feel like we spend a lot of time and it's great. I, I love people coming in and telling us our issues, and we kind of know them, we know the problems. Uh, to me, I, I'd like to spend some time focusing on solutions. Mm -hmm. We know the problem, we, we know the statistics, we know the burdens, we know, we know, we know. What can we do about it now? And I think there's a great opportunity to hear about some potential solutions. And I'm excited about it, because I think this is great. I think Tiny Homes is an awesome alternative and can be done in so many ways, and it's flexible and on and on we go, so I'm pumped up. I like seeing you pumped up here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I also want to say that that all sounds great. And also we have to keep in mind that when we're inviting the public in, and part of the reason is a listening session to hear what they think, we may get, no matter how much we focus it in some way or another, try and give diverse perspectives, we're gonna be hearing possibly all perspectives. That's just what happens. Yeah, and, and I think that, I think, I mean, that, that is the value of this, of this space that we're getting into with the listening sessions, is they are a mix of an educational space, and we can help to manage those expectations and the understandings, um, as long as we're on our game and we bring the right people in who really understand those things and can provide clarity on it. Um, and then the other piece that, a lot of those question marks, I think, are on the code side of things. And then on the land use and zoning side, I think that's actually a space duty too, where it would be interesting to really garner ideas from the public about, well, how would you like to see it? What's your vision of how these would be used? And that really, I think, is material that we can take in and say, okay, kind of take the temperature of people's ideas about how these are going to be used. <laughs> yeah. So um, I like that and. Um, it's, as somebody who builds houses, you know, like you can take somebody's, uh, it, I really want to have this kind of house and you're like, well, your lot's only this big, so you can only do this. <laughs> so I think what would be interesting is if when you guys scope this, I don't think the general public really understands land use codes and um, zoning. So if, like with the ADU discussion, I keep hating that I'm putting my back to you. That's okay. But remember how they had a, a an example of this is what a garage looks like when it's got something built on it, and this is what, so like there's literally a visual, because most people think when you say tiny houses, tiny houses are gonna be allowed as ADUs, but there's a difference in a tiny house on a trailer with equitable ownership for each individual and something that's on a slab that is cost burden to the uh, owner to buy and that is a different zoning, different mm -hmm. codes. So if there's a elemental way of breaking that down that would show the discussion and frame it in an educational way, um, and that to me is the whole thing about breaking it down is um, there is, if you're just talking houses, there's how you're gonna build it, there's all the different types of houses you could build, what's actually allowed where it's allowed, because we've it still adheres to the ADU laws, and then um, where we want to go, it, where we would use it as a possible tool, and what is possible that's out there, because we've never really looked at it before because it's always been illegal. Well, next meeting is. Well, the next meeting it's next happening. Meeting. So we're right, this is yeah. pertinent for next meeting. Right. We, should be, we should be talking about it. Right, and that's why I kind of wanted yeah. to have this. I think some, some of it is who do discussion. we bring in to talk if we're going to frame all this. Right. That's yeah. what the reason why we're trying to make sure we're on the same page. Go ahead, Dave. So the other thing I think, um, and, and realizing there's only so much you can do to control this, but 
if we had a, a set of, I don't know, four questions or something for the public input part of the listening session mm-hmm. saying, this is what we want so we don't have um, something coming completely out of right field and then that triggers that and then we kind of lose the focus of it. And so if we just say, you know, and, and we just we have to reiterate it a bunch of times, I'm sure, but at least if we have that parameter to begin with, I think it'll make it uh, a lot more effective going forward. And Chris, the one thing I was thinking, one thing I was thinking also, based on what you had said about doing some kind of scoping work on this, is I do think it would be beneficial probably, Judy um, and Mason, if you want to jump back in on it, but I'm also kind of getting a little bit more sane in my life, I could do it too, where we sit with you or Jay prior to this and we craft our mm-hmm. our program and our meeting carefully so that we're we're walking in with a good you know solid program and and then what Jay is presenting can address some of these things that we've just talked about um, and he can present it um, you know it, I had a question with him for his knowledge of the actual building code aspect but he seemed to be comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. So he is very possibly just capable of presenting all of that, and that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Um, But just so that we've really done our due diligence on what it is we're presenting to the public, how we're presenting it, and then, as you said, what we're asking back from them. It might be kind of interesting when they sign up for public, you know, when they want to talk, if there were the four questions on that, so when they sign up, they could check a box that said, I'm more interested in land use, I'm more interested in design, I'm more interested in the coding piece of it, so that at least we've collected some information that might funnel down where the majority of these questions are going to be coming from. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And then we're collecting something for the report that Judy would be mm-hmm. doing afterwards as well. So if I could just make sure I'm understanding. So it sounds like, I mean, we do meet monthly to with a chair and vice chair to kind of think through the next meeting. So what I'm hearing is that we're going to have, um, Corey can reach out, we, should, we can schedule time outside of that meeting to kind of scope this. And it sounds like what we'll be doing is involving Judy and possibly Mason, if you're interested in helping us kind of round this out, that'd be great. Um, so we will, um, reach out in the next day or so to find a t- time so for us to meet with Jay. I'm fine with having coming up with four questions and shaping the program. I don't need to participate in that part. We're still going to have, I'm not, obviously, I'm not, nobody thinks I should disinvite the people I've already arranged this with and worked with. So if you guys want to add other elements to it and come up with four questions, I, I, I'm fine with whatever the questions are. I know, I know little okay. to nothing about tiny homes, so I'm happy. And since we can't have more than two people, <laughs> two board members without you know, having it be a public right. meeting or whatever, okay. maybe you guys can do it or something and I can work on the publicity. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we'll be contacting Jacques and- Terry, do you want to jump in on any of that? You were pumped up. Yeah, sure. So who are- Yeah, the why don't you guys do it? Okay. All right, so Terry and I'll work with you, Kristen and Jay, okay. to get that kind of put together. The other piece, the other piece that was brought up was the format again. Do you want to talk to that? Speak to that a little bit about the. Uh, I wanted to say Siberian. It's not Siberian. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> Samoan. <laughs> oh, oh, no, and it's and we're not and it's being called something else now too, right? Remember? Um, <laughs> yes. I, but do you want to mention? Oh, okay. Um, you probably know about as much about that as me. Um, Brenda Rittenauer has this great idea for a listening session that she would like to come next time um, for just a little bit to discuss this idea and see if we might be interested in incorporating it in one of our listening sessions in the future. Mm-hmm. So Brenda, who's part of the city's community engagement team, is. Um, uh, offering to come and facilitate, well, she's she's actually available to attend the next meeting to describe kind of how we facilitate this type of discussion. I believe you were anticipating that she would be coming in April to help facilitate that listening session. Is that, I thought the tiny homes was gonna be in February, I mean, not April, March, I think I'm losing a month. So in February it's tiny homes and then the next listening session. It would probably be April, but we haven't, that's something we're gonna discuss tonight. Yeah. Right. So yeah. when are you anticipating that? Um, she come? Brenda it depends come. on how the board feels after she comes and presents her idea. Okay. 
Well, she's on the schedule to come next month, but essentially uh, the community engagement tool, it's actually very similar to something that Mason participated in as part of the, the video that you saw where you, you have a group of individuals who are experiencing whatever the topic is and bring different perspectives to it and you're listening into their conversation about how they've experienced this, um, whatever the topic might be. And then it, it kind of fuels a different way of communicating and sharing information. Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna be able to do it justice. Brenda's gonna be much better at explaining, but it's just a really unique opportunity for us to figure out new ways of engaging our community members in this conversation. So Brenda is scheduled to come next month and she'll be able to present it and we can see if it's a tool you're interested in using in the future. Okay, thanks for that. I wasn't clear myself if that was something that we were considering for this February session, but it sounds like we'll stay with the format that we used last time then. Okay, all right. Um, anybody else, anything else on that you wanna add in? No? Judy, you good? I'm good. Got it out? Yeah. Okay. Um, so now we move on to that April listening session. And the topic question is still to be decided. So I think there's just some discussion we can have around what the topic for that April listening session is. Um, if anybody has anything, I know we brought up the renters at one point. I thought that's kind of where we were positioning from the past meetings, but uh, I'm curious if anybody else has other ideas or thoughts. Judy. So I went back and looked at when we discussed that, um, and there are a number of ideas that people had, um, but we did give heavy weight to talking about renters, and even after listening to what Chris said tonight, about 55% of the people in Boulder are renters, and we wanted to make sure we did it when school was in session, and if we waited till May, they'd already be in final, so April seems good, but the topics that people also broke up, brought up were contractors, accessibility, and middle-income people. Um, but there's one other thing I want to mention that I talked about you, with you tonight, the, um, City Council talked about the letters from the board at their January, I think, 6th meeting or 9th meeting or something like that. And Mary Young summarized our letter, and she did a really great job of doing it. And then there was only one comment about it afterwards, and that was by Adam, who said that, um, yay, Adam, <laughs> who said that the, um, Arts Committee, as was already mentioned tonight, is very interested in housing, and he thought it would be a great idea if sometime we had a listening session and invited them to participate and bring artists and talk about artists' housing needs. And so I just wanted to throw that in. I, I hope we do renters in April. Any other? I think, uh, from what I recall, I, re I remember us saying April was a good time to do it a little bit warmer out, everybody would still be here, more or less, and so it would be a good opportunity to have that. Uh, my, my thought in terms of scoping out exactly how we tackle that one, because mm -hmm. you said it could get pretty unruly, is maybe it would be best to see how things shake out next month, and then that, that could give us some good insight as to what we could do in terms of shaping it out rather than just kind of extrapolating out. I'd like to see how Tiny houses, which is probably not as all-encompassing, uh, goes, and we can kind of figure out how to best address the renters issue. And maybe it's even part one, and the notion that there's going to be a part two somewhere down the line, because it's such a broad issue. But okay. I was just going to say, do we want to then move forward with? making a motion maybe at this point in time to say that the topic will be renters. But moving forward, I, as Danny's mentioning, kind of formalize what the goals of that topic actually are um, and how we're gonna structure it. Or is that the cart before the horse? The reason why, oh. you'll go further. The reason why I really like the that. In the back of the <laughs> horse. On the horse. The reason why I really like that is because, um, as the engagement committee, uh, it 
I shouldn't be the one deciding those things. So to have that discussion ahead of time, and I basically am just doing the publicity yeah, part for it. But I hope we put that on the February agenda because to do it in April, it needs it needs that focus right away. So we can go. I can go on it with the programming and letters and publicity. So that's great. So I therefore move that for the April listening session, um, the topic is renters. Second. Anybody else have any further discussion around that? Shall we vote? Jerry. I'm, I'm gonna, I'll vote yes for this, but I just wanna caution the, the idea of just having a lot of people come in here and say, oh, renting in Boulder is really hard and, you know, <clears throat> it's really expensive and I pay a lot of rent and my land, you know, I mean, I just, uh, we, we need to really think about how we want to scope this out and how we want to focus the conversation. That's all I'm saying. But I do like the idea of, of having it as a listening session. And I'm and not even tug in cheek that my garbage disposal doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like we got a really air conditioning up. isn't so good, you know. And I, uh, <laughs> I think okay, <laughs> next month can be a really good opportunity <laughs> to figure out what we need to do to really pare that down and keep it focused. Yeah, exactly. That one can go. That's away. that's what I'm getting at. But yes. I think it's a good idea. Let's bring the renters in. Can I add a comment to that? Yes. I think it's gonna be important to have somebody in the room who knows a lot about renters' rights in Colorado uh, because there are gonna be a lot of questions about, oh, um, this happened and uh, someone would need to be able to say, well, there's no, there's nothing that protects uh, you or us for, from that kind of thing, or there is, you know, and so it'd be uh, important to have someone who with that kind of, that depth of knowledge. If Mm -hmm. City and state, yeah. Mason. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're saying for renters is exactly what I'm saying for tiny homes or any of these sessions. We need to have grown-ups in the room that can answer the questions, that are framing out these discussions so that same thing, we are listening to people coming in, but that we're managing expectations. So this is why I was putting back out to the board that it's important who's here and at the table, that we have the experts, that we've got the scoped information, that um, if people do come in, we can answer the questions. Yeah, one thing um, along the lines of the scheduling, so, our next meeting is a listening session. There's not a lot of time and space in that event for a further discussion. So it may be necessary that we, between now and then, put something together to start fleshing out what this is gonna look like. Yep. Got a microphone? Do we have to have it in April or can we bump it? I mean, it doesn't have to be April, right? Yeah. I know we're trying to capture the students, but again, maybe this is a good point. Like, do we really, are we trying to focus on students or are we trying to focus on families that rent, you know, like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So so maybe there's an opportunity, you know, I don't know that because students may be in finals would be a bad time to talk to renters. I don't know if that's a good reason. So if we need to bump it another month to really flesh it out, it's probably not the worst idea to me. Well, so there's a vote on the floor. Right, we so we vote, so we vote. I think, we're discussing. I think we're, we're in the discussion phase of that. So, and I think these are all really valid points um, as we consider it. So, I'll, can I address that yeah. point? I think, first of all, I think your ideas are really good and I think to have it focused and I think one could do it by having it focused on solutions and we can stress that it's just solutions. And we, I could even, in the letter to the editor, put something sort of funny like, you know, we don't want to hear that your garbage disposal is not working. <laughs> That's not what this is about. You know, we want to hear what your ideas are for solutions to, to renters' issues. We also want to hear the, the large issues, but we want, we want to look at solutions. And um, I, I think two of us can get together and come up with an idea that we can bring up to the board at at the February meeting afterwards. I mean, we're gonna discuss something after the listening session and that might as well be the thing, especially if two people have thought it out, you know, beforehand. Um, here's where I would ask a question about procedure. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> and 
done putting on your procedure hat now. <laughs> okay, yeah. um, so we have a motion on the table. Um, there was some interest in potentially moving this to May. Um, how can we handle this? Can we do a friendly amendment on this? And see if that flies for May? I think that it does I think work. that would work? That is correct. You can, anybody can propose a friendly amendment. Right. May I That's also, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, still in the realm of discussion, because I don't think we've closed that down, right? Yeah, we discussed a couple of times taking this off site and maybe May with students, pizza up on campus makes sense at that time. Just putting it out there. Okay, we did discuss that. Having it off site, I remember that. Mm -hmm. So by our meeting in May, they're gone? The students are no. gone? No, I don't believe I, so, are they? Last day of class is April 30th, so um, the finals week is the first week in May. So they'll, they won't be so here much in May. Students will be gone in May. There, there's a lot of students that stay for the summer you know, I don't know that we're gonna get 30,000 people showing up to this. <laughs> Along those lines, I think that's a really good point is if, if finals are the first week in May, <laughs> the chance that there's gonna be students coming on the, the you know, on the 23rd. Well, again, 23rd is our goal April. to have students? Is it yeah. student focused? No, that's what I'm saying. You know I mean, is that, is that if, even if what we're worried about? part of the driving factor, <laughs> that's right, because I, I don't know that they're gonna come in April either because they're gonna be worried about finals. I'm gonna make a friendly amendment to move the, the what is it, April, listening session for tenants to May. Can we vote on that? So, so this is up to Judy right. who made the motion. So oh. I'm not going to, so you can just vote down, you can just vote down mine and bring it up again if okay. you want, but I, okay. I, I think April um, could still get students. I don't think it's that close to finals. And I think with them being 50, with renters being 55% of the population, I just think it's, I think we can pull it together in three months. It's, January. May I interject? And I, I, <laughs> I hesitantly interject with this, um, but I feel like I'd be remiss if I did not mention. Um, so while the student population and their housing needs is a concern of the community and definitely adds pressure to the community, I just wanna be really clear that our, our housing portfolio, our permanently affordable housing portfolio is not available to the traditional college yep. student. Great point. So as you're looking at scoping this project or this type of listening session, I think we just need real clarity in um, the outcomes that we would be hoping to achieve because one of those outcomes, I, I would venture to say, would not likely be that we would be opening up um, our permanently affordable housing portfolio to serve that particular population. So mm -hmm. when you brought up um, the family, dynamic of this conversation, I think that could be an interesting angle. Not saying don't attract students, but I just think we need to be really clear as to what the actual outcomes of receiving that feedback could be within our rules and regulations of our programs. Good point. So Good point. Our, our mission isn't permanently affordable housing, it's housing in general. And I think there's a lot of neighborhoods like Martin Acres and the Hill that have real issues because of renters and those are people who live in those neighborhoods who aren't students as well. And so, although obviously affordable, permanently affordable housing is my biggest interest, I, I have a real feeling for, for, all, for all renters, students and non-students and you know, I'm fine, vote it down and pick another time, pick another topic, it's fine. But I, I feel April is, is the most fair to the people, to the wide range of people we wanna be at a listening session, that's all. I'm gonna get really, I'm gonna get really procedural here. Um, the motion was specifically for the April listening session, correct? Yeah, correct. So we, we tagged it to April. Um, I'm kind of, I do think that this further discussion, this is my perspective on the discussion, is valuable and that getting the goals and objectives clear is really important. Um, and also being clear that we can do that by April. So I think there's two questions that are laid on the table here. One is, what's the focus and is it students? And if it's not necessarily specifically students, are we hurting ourselves by moving to May and the second one is, you know, do we think we can put it together for April um, with a good cohesive focus? Um, 
in order to do that, we can either vote on Judy's motion, and that will say that we are doing this in April, and we'll move forward with that, or we could vote on that, and depending where that goes, we could further discuss how we're going to how we're going to do it. But we, I, I guess, what I'm trying to do is disconnect the May the date from the topic of from the topic because we have those two pieces that we're uh, fighting with. Mm -hmm. Am I good? Yep. Also, taking a step back, I mean, listening sessions are kind of a big deal, you know, that, you know, so we're having one next month and then an, an one, two months after that. How many do we want to have this year? And if we're, kind of seems like we'd be front loading them a little bit versus giving us a little time in between. That's the other thing I just want people to think about. And I think we should, well, you call the vote because you're the chairman, but let's vote on it. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. I looked up the only thing that the board voted on was for 2019. We don't have to have another listening session at all ever if we don't want. We haven't actually, we haven't actually um, decided that. So that's a factor. Well, Mason. I also think we need to kind of keep in mind that once the work plan for city council hits, we could fill up dramatically and not even know. So there is an argument to potentially wait and see when that, when, when will that kick out? that will have a solid work plan. When do you guys like do your magic and decide what we have to look at for the next year? Um, I don't know the exact date, but it was pretty firmly discussed um, this past weekend at the retreat, and so I think it's pretty much defined. Okay. Um, we have a sense of what our priorities are gonna be, and what we could do is share that with the HAB. Awesome. Um, over, you know, as soon as possible to inform what might be good topics. Great. To conduct a listening session. I guess. My thought is, I think this is a really important listening session. And I, I know that we didn't commit to any particular ones, but we did even put it in the letter as that's one of the things that we were gonna focus on. I really would like to make sure that we do it right. Um, I'm, I'm very open to moving it back to make sure that we do it right and that we're not getting too hasty because of you know our own presupposed schedule previously um, and really try to, try to nail it, so. I'm, I'm very open to moving the date based on that. I understand where you're coming from, Julia. I absolutely do. I just, uh, I, I, my concern would be, um, you know, we get the tidal wave of, you know, the last listening session we had, I mean, I think we were here till 10 something or whatever. And then all of a sudden then we're gonna like, all right, let's try to get this dialed in now at the end of that listening session, it's gonna be 10.45, everyone's gonna be like, you know, seeing double and then, <laughs> And then all of a sudden, voila, we have some. So going. since you seconded it, if you're agreeable, I'll just withdraw my motion completely. And um, it can also be done in September. I, I, I want, I mean, my interest in renters is renters, which would be both students and non-students. Right. So if we did it at the end of August or the end of September, that's another possibility. So, and we, but we do have to discuss if we want to have listening sessions at all. and and when we want them and all that. And I'm, I'm more than happy to withdraw it. I appreciate that. And I think there's, you know, we, part of this could be discussing what is the ideal date for it, you know, because we were talking about this in November, um, very kind of figuratively. And all the things that we've discussed here today really kind of underscore that for me that, you know, it's going to be a really challenging one. I, I There's no question it's going to resonate a lot more and you can uh, expect a lot more public turnout than you would with other ones. And including, what's the best forum for it. So I'm more than happy to say, maybe we table the discussion as to when to do that one. Maybe that's not even the next listening session and maybe a broader discussion on listening sessions, but I'm more than happy to withdraw my seconding just because of everything that we talked about here. Great. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say right now, but <laughs> it appears that Judy's motion has been <laughs> withdrawn. <laughs> so the mule's back behind the horse. The mule's back behind the horse. That said, we still have a, we still have a question of, of are we doing a listening session? From a procedural perspective, we don't have to make a motion to, I'm asking no. this a question. We don't have to make a motion to say, we want to have a student listening session at some point in the future, uh, you know, the next six months, let's say, or sometime this year. We don't have to make a motion for that. We can just say, let's talk about it next time, right? 
You are correct. Okay. Yeah. Why don't we just talk about it next time? Or maybe the time after that, because next time is going to be busy with the tiny homes. Yeah. And by then we'll have our work plan and we'll know where to And we'll know more of what our schedule is. All right. Retreat. Can I? We need to, we've just withdrawn that and we're agenda. good. I, I might throw a little <laughs> wrench in this. I know where you're I was, wait, I was waiting she wants to for some confirmation via text, so students I think it would be um, valuable for the HAB to consider that at the retreat this past weekend, City Council um, has asked Housing and Human Services to do a presentation April 14th to them regarding our homeless services initiatives and having a community conversation about um, other approaches or um, strategies that we should be using or could be using or exploring. They do intend to reach out to the Housing Advisory Board as well as HRC and other community boards to get feedback. And so the timing is a little bit awkward and so that's why I was hesitant to bring it up and I wanted to just get confirmation from uh, Kurt that if you were to do some sort of listening session around the topic of homelessness, and that would probably need a lot of scoping and queuing up the same way we're talking about tiny homes, um, there could be an opportunity to do a listening session in March that would then inform the conversation that's happening with City Council on April um, 14th. So, sorry, I wasn't able to insert that earlier, but just needed to see if that would be palatable to the our okay. yeah. director. Mason. I know that feels really fast to some. Um, the I was I was scoping out something else with a with a different organization, and some of these things just come cl flying at your face. It was kind of like when Jill got on council and we did gun gun laws right away. Is that sometimes these things happen kind of fast and. It's a great point um, because the working group and they're gonna come for suggestions. So Adam and Rachel um, proposed uh, a suite of services to be offered for the gaps that are being either created or left behind by coordinated entry. And um, they wanted to put it on the work plan. They whittled it down to a working group sesh um, to happen April 14th, asked council to come forward with a. Um, scoping some of these things out. And then Rachel asked if the boards could take a look at, um, uh, from our perspectives on the same issues and bring to council our thoughts on it. Um, and I have a copy of what Adam had proposed as well. Um, so you're right, it would be, March would, be, it's tight and it would be a t um, possibly a tight way to try and suss it out, but it, it, it's timely and we should figure out how it is on their work plan and it is something they've asked us to help with, so. Juliet. Kristen, would your program or your plan, your presentation be prepared by then, by March, yeah. on that subject because I think the presentation that you prepare for council is going to be informing them, but it would probably be helpful for us to have that background information as well and maybe have incorporate some of that mm -hmm. into the sort of, not just the listening part, but the informational part of our, of our listening session. I think we could do what's needed to prepare for that conversation and to have you be informed. Um, and the public to be informed during that listening session. It would be a different presentation than one. So City Council in January received a presentation about what we are already doing and the successes and the traction we have made. Um, and so this next one is kind of looking at additional services, additional strategies that could be come into play. So we're gonna be doing this work in preparation for that April session with City Council. So if I'm understanding your question, I think I think we could easily package some sort of information so it would be an informing um, and well-rounded conversation for this group. So my question is, would the purpose, and maybe Mason, you can answer this too, would the purpose of what Rachel wanted to be to hear the public's ideas for solutions, like, th is, is that? I, th 
my interpretation, and you you were sitting there too, my interpretation was that when Sam had suggested making it over into a working group, she was, because they've got obligations, so the earliest they could touch it was April. So Rachel said, why don't we have the Housing Advisory Board, and I think she suggested one of the board, take a, uh, the Human Rights Commission, yes. I think, right? Mm -hmm. Take a look at these and weigh in on it so that we have these recommendations all packaged together when April hit. So ideas. So then what I, then what I just wanted to say is, Thus far, every listening session, I and mean, we basically had three. We had the two about um, the affordable housing experience funding, affordable housing, but then we had one the year before on just people's issues about housing, and they were all really good and successful, and I think although this is short timing, this is really an opportunity for us to really provide some input to, um, to council, and, and so my inclination would be to go for it. And maybe it doesn't have to be a full listening session. Maybe it's just something we announce to the public that if you have thoughts on this and you want to contribute in some fashion, you know, my guess it would be wonks that ha are really paying attention to it, and then a few people who just want to be heard. Sounds like more of an agenda item, really. Right. Like that's, where, that's where I'm nailing yeah. down to yeah, this. Maybe we're, we're, we put it on the agenda as a, as a major part of the, the meeting. Yeah. But it's not an official listening session. We don't bump it to that category. Right. Yeah. That's. But we have a public comment. Sure. Sure. Element yeah. of it. Yeah. 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 I absolutely agree. That's what I'm. There you go. <laughs> that's what I was leaning towards too. It's like, <laughs> it's almost a working session, or a study session. Yeah, kind of. for us, mm -hmm. because I think this thing of engaging with Would this, this be our first study session? Well, it really wouldn't be a study session because the public can't put, doesn't comment mm -hmm. study sessions. It would be public. But we could have it, in a sense, maybe split, mm -hmm. where we have a, a, a study session. We can work on this concept of a suite of services and filling those gaps that exist, and but have a significant component of that, which, again, we could put a letter out to say that, this is what's happening at this meeting. We're looking for public input in these areas, and you know this is what the format of the meeting will be. There will be a public input from X hour to Y hour. And He's got his little that. finger. I just have a little planning board. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, we, we often uh, um, get from staff key questions that um, uh, get put up at the end of the presentation. Uh, those key questions are often really useful to drive uh, how we then disseminate information from our board to the city council on, on what we deliberate on, but also for the public comment. So, um, so that might be a good way to kind of set up those questions to not just ask uh, the board, but also some that kind of stimulate the public mm -hmm. to, to provide some of their thoughts as well. Great thought. I have one wrinkle to put in this. During the calendar section, I was gonna mention that I believe our next meeting is scheduled during spring, I mean our March meeting is scheduled during spring break, and we might have to pick a different time. It's up to you to decide, but if we do, then that would be a different place, and it, so we'd have to give Corey enough time to make sure it was a place where people could come. So those of you with kids, Are you, e the suggestion is to change the date of that meeting or just to? I'm just saying if we end up at the end of the, we decide to do this, which is mm -hmm. a great idea and I hope we do, we might be doing it earlier in March and we might not be doing it in this room. So. If we move we, it we up. We need a place where the public, you know, could gather. Corey, do you think that's feasible to find a space? Well, do we, um, let's first agree whether or not we need to move the date and then. Right. So it just depends on whether or not you guys agree to. Um, it It depends on when in March. Um, a lot of retreats happen March, April, so if we're pushing it either later or earlier, um, space could be a challenge, and you know, I always try to consider parking, public transit for folks to get to these spots, um, and so right now it's just a busy time. Um, it could be a challenge, but it's not impossible. I could find something that could potentially work, but that's only if you guys decide to vote to move the meeting. Terry, what were the dates on the spring break? Uh, the 25th. 25th is the last Wednesday, which is during spring break. 
the 18th, which is the week, the Wednesday before, it's not spring break, 18th? It's the 23rd through the 27th. It's the last week of March. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And our meeting is on the 25th, right in the middle. smack in the, middle. Right in the middle. So what I'm saying is we bump it back a week to the 18th. Who's all gonna be gone first? Mm, Let's gone. decide that before we start looking at <laughs> I don't know yet for sure. I don't have plans, but likely. I have a kid, I have no plans yet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere either. Hey, you guys have a good time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I guess the piece, the concern is just that besides us, that we're going to be missing the public. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I mean, do you think that's like a half of us are staying? Half of us. Half of half of both. We're half and staying. half. Yeah. The half that can't afford to jet set around is staying. <laughs> hey, I got a house to build. <laughs> I'm a driver. I drive. Yeah. <laughs> well then. I think maybe we should look to move that date. Um, you gonna motion and vote? Yeah. Terry, again, you got the calendar up over there. June 18th, March 18th is the week before. Calendar. March 18th is the Wednesday before the currently scheduled HAB meeting. Oh, my. <laughs> this one. Shall we make? Is that an option to have in this room, Corey? No. Not an no. option. No. Not in here. Okay. How about yeah. downstairs. Oof. That's, that's very small, and we had that listening session in there last it was time. A little awkward. Just sitting around the table with staff and board members weird. is very tight. I think it's just got bad vibes from that last one anyway. We don't want to go back there. <laughs> I, I'm happy to work with Corey to see if we can find a place um, that's that will hold some people. Yeah, larger than that. What about the first? No. April 1st. So we still have to talk about the HAB retreat, which is on the next yeah. line item. And uh, from the doodle poll, April 6th looked to be the date that worked the best for everyone's schedules. Yeah. So we can't, I don't know if you guys want to have um, two yeah. meetings in a week. Good point. Right. A lot of hanging out. Well, I'm gonna have, you used, oh, sorry. have you ever used the Brenton building uh, space? The, there's a really nice room that planning board has used in the Brenton building over at Alpine Balsam area. And uh, it's bigger than any of the conference rooms here. And Cindy's set it up with all the recording and everything <laughs> in the past. Is that available to the public to come and go? Uh, yeah, there's park, you know, there's parking over there and yeah, the, um, it, There's a just, building lost. So I, I would sorry, you just unlocked the, oops, I just spilled some water. So I think that's a really good suggestion that we can Kay. look into. And what I suggest is for the board to make a decision if you want to change the date, and then we will work to find a place. Okay. Since Mason's coming back, um, I'll set a, I'll make a motion to move our March meeting from the 25th to Wednesday the 18th. I order all over the place. Second. Okay, seconded by Judy. Do we want to have a vote on that? Yeah. All in favor? Okay, so unanimous, so we'll move that meeting to the 18th. And I think we'll be able to find somewhere to, to have that. And it might be a good option to go somewhere outside of city space too. I mean, maybe one of the churches or some, mm -hmm some space where we could have that discussion. Is that, no, just seriously, because I just had a crazy, I had an idea, maybe we could just, we could do like a big meal, it would be really cool, hmm. somewhere, if we're gonna do that. So, um, Safe feeds the unhoused, but it's on Saturdays. It's usually not on Wednesday evenings, but inside of a church. That would be interesting. Mm -hmm. um, there's that church that uh, we do the sleep out at in front of mm -hmm. detention homes. Yeah. 
they'd probably be open to it. They they seat quite a few people in there. So what I suggest in that cafeteria. That if we're, we, it sounds like we've just the board has decided to move to March 18th. Maybe we uh, pursue uh, two of you to work mm -hmm. together with right. staff to kind of scope this out and yeah, what the good. options might be. Yeah, yeah we're not going to we're not going to solve the details of it now, um, but it does sound like it would be something that we can do, which would be interesting. Maybe we can move it out into the community. Maybe we can do an event of sorts also mm -hmm. to support the homeless and then or the unhoused, and then we'll we will. Who would like to work on that? If we can get two of us to, I'm in. Can I? Hey, yeah, have, down, absolutely in. Terry Mason. Okay, great. Okay, Mason, I got a good idea. All right, I so later. Good ideas. Awesome. So in just structuring that, I guess um, we're looking at our March meeting. Um, 18th. I don't know that we'll need to make any specific decisions at the February meeting around this, um, but we would want to have something maybe kind of formulated by then if you guys think you can pull that off absolutely so we can hear about it i was just going to suggest that you do want to do that otherwise we can't do publicity okay. for it mm -hmm. um, especially since it's a, the meeting is a whole week earlier yep, yep. than usual um, but also do we need to then vote that we want to have a homeless idea session or public public input or whatever it's called yeah, I think we've left the full list. I, um, I guess that's uh, something to discuss, but we, I feel like we've left the full listening session yes. topic item that was on the agenda. Um, I don't know, do we need to make a motion to focus on that for our March meeting? Does that require a motion? I don't think oh, so. I don't think no, so. just an agenda yeah, deal. It's an agenda, agenda item now, and item. I think it'll come yeah. up with you and I in the agenda. Okay, the only reason why I bring it up is if you really do want publicity on it, it does have to be it determined early, unless you don't care, unless you all vote that you don't care what the letter is, and I could just work it out with the, somebody well, from the committee. Or something. Maybe what we can do is Mason and Terry can put together the, Great. the particulars that you'd like to see go out in a letter, and then Judy can draft it and put it together and get it out there. But if we can have all that to Judy and I don't know, Two, three I like weeks, how you're so. just like I'm this. Just like <laughs> go. I do. I do want to insert that, that this is a very quick turnaround, yeah. and while we are um, in support, would be supporting Hab and pulling off such an event, we are also working very hard to pull the content together for this, and that that's a big lift as well. So I just I just mentioned that. Like I think these are all beautiful ideas, but we just we have to kind of calibrate um, with the content versus event planning. So I just ask that that be considered. Um, we'll take care of the event side. I already just sent out three. I got it. <laughs> We're gonna figure this. Out. Yeah, I think that's what I was. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's what I was gonna say. I think we'll cover. We'll cover that side. This, you your putting this together. Okay. And you just will. Okay. You yeah, can Corey, focus on what you're gonna do, and we'll do this. Okay. Well, let's definitely, if we can, to have that meeting and conversation sooner rather than later with Mason and yeah. who is Terry. Terry's going to be working on it, mm -hmm. just so we're all on the same page as to what the expectations are from staff. And our next agenda setting meeting is on, or the one for the March meeting, I should say. Corey, do you know what that date looks like? On my calendar really quick. Because we'll need to have the info by then, so ideally at least. <laughs> So right now your next HAB chair meeting is scheduled for March 17th, which is a Tuesday morning. Okay, which is the day before the... Right, so we'll have to, to move that up. Yeah, we're that. gonna be moving that up, okay. so... Do you wanna do it uh, the week before? On, you wanna keep the Tuesday? Yeah, let's keep the Tuesday okay. and move it up a week. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I think we're good on that for now. We'll go to March, we'll focus on homeless for that meeting. Um, all right, try to get back on. Um, HAB retreat planning. Uh, just briefly, I think we said April 6th is what's looking like what works for everybody. Uh, David, I think you said you could make that and we'd if you, yeah, if you think it would be useful to have me there, I'd, I think uh, that's been done in the past with ex so. I'm just okay. checking when Gar is, if, does, if anybody else knows when Gar is. 
can't remember when it's the... Hold on in just a sec. Yeah. Judy, you're poised, go. Well, I was just wanting to save time. Yeah. And could, could it just be that you and I as board chair and vice chair plan the retreat, but ask everyone to give their ideas about the retreat to us in the next week, and then we'll come up with the format? Just to make it easy, we can do it a different way if you want, but I just wanted to move along. Yeah, no, I agree. I think the one question that I had is if we have in Corey a budget, have we talked about facilitator and yeah. bringing a facilitator in for this retreat? Um, I want the woman that worked with council. She was <laughs> awesome. Uh, and if that is something, I think that's something we probably put to a motion quickly here and get everybody's take on having a facilitator at the retreat or not, if that's what we're going to do. So I'm just gonna put a motion out real quickly that we do have a facilitator for our retreat. And uh, on April 6th, can we do this all in one motion? That we'll have our retreat on April 6th and that we will have it facilitated, facilitator TBD. Okay. And Terry seconded, any discussion or thoughts on it that you wanna put out? Okay. so. In that case, um, all the A's for that. Okay, again, unanimous for April 6th retreat date and a facilitator to be determined. Thank you. Can I just clarify really quick? So there are a variety of facilitators that the city has um, traditionally used. Um, Heather Bergman being who was at the city council retreat this past weekend. Do you want to play a role in the selection of the facilitator? And if so, who would, would that be the chair and vice chair? Okay. okay. I think the person too that also did it last year was great. Yeah. 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 So whoever, I mean, we, we had two that piggybacked together last year. I can't remember what their names were at the, yeah. I mean, I, I'm pretty oh. sure anybody's um, gonna be great. From yeah. our staff. Kristen, would you just share those names Sure. With Judy and I, or, okay. or with the whole board as it is, and then um, if there are any thoughts from anybody on the board, send them to us. Otherwise, Judy and I will take a look at those and uh, and make a choice okay. at the next chair's meeting. Great. Okay. I'm comfortable with that. That's Great. Um, this last item, real quick, was we had had some discussion. Judy brought it up again at the agenda meeting about in one of our last meetings around just kind of how we engage with public comment and an input from the public. And I know we got into kind of mired into this, well, we're not really any type of a quasi judicial thing. And I just wanted to, we put it on here just to make a quick re review of that because I don't know, it was Terry. Yeah, we talked a bunch about it, and we just want to revisit it if there's something that we need to follow like up with. Almost solve a problem we didn't have yet. I so to refresh your about. memories, I think it was the two the two of you had a really good idea about possibly starting a committee to when people bring issues to us that we can try well, and find committee. them yeah, help, and the then the idea for a committee either fizzled or we ran out of time, but it was sort of left hanging, and it was something that both of you were interested in. Um, and is it something you care, you know, I just didn't want to leave something dangling that the two of you cared oh, no. about at the time. Yeah. yeah, and my recollection was we kind of talked through it and it, it fizzled because the feeling was it was gonna, we're we should let it fizzle. Yep. Okay, so unless there's somebody else. Okay, so we'll leave that one behind. Um, matters from staff. Mm -hmm. So the um, matters from staff, the final letter um, to council was posted. Uh, so that it's available to the public. Um, and I think that was the only item. That was it? That we yeah. okay. posted it. Great. Um, so calendar check, we've kind of already gone through a fair chunk of that. Yeah. Judy? I have one more about you have the one November on there? meeting. The November meeting is right. Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving Eve, I think. I mean, the Wednesday. Change that. Wednesday. Corey, can you have a turkey here for us? <laughs> <laughs> And booze. <laughs> Peppermintinis, anyone? <laughs> so the November meeting falls on um, 25th, which is the day before Thanksgiving. Two. 
is it? It's Danny's birthday. Oh, oh, sweet. We need cake. Oh, we'll have oh, cake awesome. and turkey, please. <laughs> so, yeah. Or you could jump out of the cake. Um, mm. <laughs> Do we? Just like a turkey. <laughs> Dress like a turkey. Yeah. I'm going to suggest we put that in our in our pipes, and we all smoke it later. Smoke it later, and then at a further future meeting, we can decide on that one. We got a little bit of lead time on it, okay. so um, could we just do a doodle poll for pull, for for times? I mean, people do things on yep. vacation, stuff like that. You know, for maybe the week before. I have a comment about that, and that we'll, we'll have more insight into the work plan that City yeah. Council has, and we may. That may impact. I think, yeah, that'll impact exactly what our schedule looks like for the rest of the, the year. I think that's a good call. I don't even know where I'm going for spring break, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 11 months from now. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna say that we will keep that in mind and we'll look to that okay. as we move forward. Um, quick debrief. Anybody have any debrief comments? Nice yeah. job running the meeting. Thank you. Very nice. Can we get him a, a gavel? <laughs> <laughs> there is a gavel somewhere. Well, I I want to say I think that was the quick pivot on the April on uh, our April listening session, although I think somewhat painful for all of us. Um, I think at the end it probably is. It's a good thing. I appreciated how everybody was willing to kind of walk around and talk through that one and, and work it out. So, good deal. Any other? With that said, we will close our April 22nd HAB meeting. Adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Did you think that was possible? What's that? I thought it was, I, I felt like we really wanted to get to.